What do you mean waiting for Jay Barino plays? We're here. Okay, copy this. Send it over. Where are we? Before I forget, a user came in last night and said that I missed something in Stormvale. So let's go and make sure we get that. Um, Rampart Tower? Or? Yeah, I think Rampart Tower. Hello, Char. It's weird coming back here. Char, do you want to play some Dawn of War 2 on Sunday? Or did you say you were busy on Sundays? I forgot. Just forget it. Hey, Bane. Not sure on Sunday. Okay. So I think what I'm looking for, they said, was above the grafted sign. I think it's like one or two rooms ahead where we are now. I said, sure, not, not sure. Oh, probably won't be away on Sunday. Okay, cool. <laughs> yep, I did. I missed the chest. Thank you to the user who pointed this out, who stopped in and streamed last night. Okay. Now, we can go back to Dragon Barrow. We can continue Dragon Barrow. We finished Volcano Manor? We sure did. Okay. We did the... We did the Divine Tower, though, again, I'm a little skeptical that we got everything in the Divine Tower, like, on or around it. I'm, like, half tempted. I'm gonna look it up. It's the... Divine Tower of Kaled items. Divine Tower of Kaled items. Sure, Fextra Life. Okay, I think we got all the important stuff, at least. Okay. I would never, Shar, if we made plans. That's why I'm making plans with you now. So that I don't... <laughs> So that I don't make new plans later. I would never do such a thing. I can't believe that you think I could possibly. What am I, a monster? Don't answer that.
See, like, why are they so slow? They're just like, they're just like really shitty dragons, you know? All the good dragons are used up in Dark Souls 3. Actually true. Oh, we gotta kill the giant, the huge ass dragon up here too. That one is interesting. A lot of people come up here earlier and kill Grail really early. Because you can get a ton of runes early. But it just doesn't feel right. It's because you can use bleed weapons and it does a percentage of her health. The real way you're, like, intended to kill her... I mean, there's no intended way, don't get me wrong. But the way that it's designed is if you kill the smaller dragons around her, then she takes percentage dra uh, damage from the dragons around her getting killed. And I think you don't have to hit her at all. I'm pretty sure that she just dies if you kill all four dragons around her. Dude, this one's huge. Holy shit. Okay, how about... Does Elden Ring bor borrow from Skyrim? I don't... I mean, maybe. I wouldn't say so. It's all kind of based in the same fantasy-esque world. Dragons are dragons, you know? Who was the first person to come up with dragons? Probably some idiot that found a dinosaur bone in ancient times. Hughes, Goodbye, Hughes. That was easy. Probably not bad ashes. I mean, the battle mage is pretty good, but I have Nephili Lu and Latena. Okay, that's that. What's going on with Hughes? Let's check. Excuse me. He came from Celia to study the Hyma Conspectus. Hyma sorcerers seek to quell conflict with cannon fire in the gavel, but Hughes developed a longing for it. Ooh la la. Sounds like he is just crazy. Crazy man. He used his power for not good. Oh, that thing's back. Who cares? Thank you. Dude, what kind of move is that? It's like they move so slow, you just imagine like, all you have to do is just... Just stomp me, like really quickly. You don't have to do like a slow wind up. I, is, it, is it like a function of them being large? I feel like this is a maybe something in media more than like how it would be in real life if you're facing like a giant fucking monster. Right? It wouldn't just be like and then you easily move out of the way. I understand larger larger living things require more energy. They require more energy to perform actions, so maybe that's one way you could explain it. I don't buy it. If they just want if if they just wanted to quickly swat us away, it would be that easy. Uh, so let's go up and do Grail. We gotta kill these other dragons on the way. I was underneath. Did you know that when you jump in this game, your entire lower half? Um, is invulnerable. Like, you t like the, basically jumping is pogged. You actually gain, you don't gain full invulnerability like you do with the dodge roll, but you have half invulnerability on your lower half, which 
I think is better. Oh, I have another question. Are there items at the top of the Scarlet Tree? Like in the Eonian Swamp? Do I need to go and climb that? Because I feel like there's probably something in that thing. Okay, there's... There's big old dragon. She's sad. Next co-op game idea, Payday 2. I tried that once with a friend from work, like, years and years ago. It was nice of him to invite me, but I just had no idea what was going on at all. No idea. <laughs> I was so confused. Did she buff them and debuff me? Is that what happened here? How did I... Am oh, I think she debuffed me. What a bitch. Yeah, we'll take that. See how that did, like, a quarter of her health? So we just kill each of these dragons. For some reason, they have less health, too. But they have red eyes, which means they do more damage. So you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. It's a big girl. Chenla for 51 months. Build more ships. <laughs> hey, I'm glad that I could help um, point that out as being obnoxious because the creator popped in and said they were going to fix that. So I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's really nice that they see that and they're like, yep, definitely needs fixed. That's good stuff, you know? That's what you like to see when you're a player and they, and your feedback is taken to heart. Okay, these three are like all chilling together, so let's maybe... Yo, bro. Will there be a new saxophone stream? Maybe. I do want to practice tonight. Ooh, big whiff. She's getting she's getting low. This might be the last one. Is that supposed to be scary? And then she just dies. It's actually pretty effed up. Large creepy skeleton? Skull? I'd like to <coughs> I'd like to practice more scales tonight and maybe start doing an actual separate recording for my uh for my recording of the of George on my mind. And maybe what I'll do is um I'll just have a separate recording through um Whatever the app is, that'll just and I'll just record my microphone so that I can get the. So I can get it without the backtrack. Is this where we? I think this is close to where we have to jump down because we still have a photograph that we have to get. I think it's down there. Pretty sure.
Percussion. Hell yeah. Percussion scares me. Percussion and piano both, because I feel like it's sort of the equivalent of... Of... Patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. Like, you have to two, do very distinct things with all your limbs at the same time. And that's a lot. That feels like a lot to me. That's the drum set? Right, right, right. I understand. I mean, what, do you have like a MF and timpani in your house that you're playing? Sight of Grace way down. Well, you know what? Let's do the Minor Erd Tree first. It might be another rotten avatar, which is a pain in the ass, but, you know. It's really just finding... It's finding the right rhythm to avoid the, the rot stomp. I think maybe you want to roll towards it, like forward diagonal, in order to avoid it and let it go over you. But if you let too much... If it does it too much and, the, like, the whole ground is covered in it, it makes it, like, impossible to avoid. Marimba, hell yeah. Also known to all you Philistines out there as like a it's like a it's like a cooler xylophone, okay? I don't How many of these dudes are there? They keep coming. Holy shit. Get out of here. Mine the arid tree. Is there a guardian? Surely there is. Yes. Ow, I got hit in fucking midair with that. Okay, he's going to start jumping soon. The, the, the putrid ones love to jump and spread the rot. Like this. So again, yeah, you want to go forward through it. But then he does it again. And he'll probably just keep doing it, so we just want to kill him quickly so that the whole ground doesn't get covered in it. All right, done. And then there's also the, the path along the bottom that we want to explore. And then I think you can go down. Well, let's go this way and see. Expensive as fuck, xylophone. You inherited it, quote unquote, from high school? I don't want to hear more about how that happened. <laughs> That's a pretty expensive take. <laughs>
This is me. Okay, we got a big boy dragon walking the the perimeter. Harry Twinkler. You mind, Twinkler? So we can get down there. Okay, let's go do the painting. This is the hardest one. Also, it's where that crazy golem is. That do that drops nothing. Should I fight him? It's probably just going to be death. Oh, that's cool. So you like, uh, you like legit repaired them. That's awesome. Ooh. Okay, this is where we want to go. This is it. This is the one. Maybe I just shouldn't be on Torrent for this. I almost feel like this would be better not on Torrent. I mean, the double jump is handy, though, so it's kind of like... Here. This feels like... A oh, no, I can't. It won't let me dismount because I'm not on solid ground. Okay, that went okay. Is this where the painter is? I'm pretty confident he's down here, but that's where the that's where the golem is too. Oh gosh, there he is. Painter said to have captured landscapes even during the last moments of those welcomed in death's embrace. The soul of the painter. Okay, fine. So it's looking out that way. I think I think he's right down here. But we really don't want to fight that golem. I mean I kinda do. He's a big challenge. Here we go. Who doesn't like drama? True, as long as you're not involved in it. Okay, wish me luck, boys. This thing is crazy. No, no, no. Panic roll, panic roll, get out. Do you see why this thing is insane?
go again. I was going to say, how long is it going to take to knock this guy over? Push him over the edge? Oh, I didn't even know we could do that. Come on. Here we go again. Okay, just get behind the pillars. You just have to use the pillars and you're okay. It's okay. He's going to be able to... I was going to say hit like through the pillar though. What I, I feel like is interesting about this one, though, is, like, he's, like, a powered-up one. There we go. Implying, like, maybe all of them used to be this way, like, insanely powerful. And this one is, like, the, he's the only one like this in the whole game. He doesn't drop anything, either. So it's almost like... I don't know. I get the impression it's, like, supposed to be sort of a, a lore clue of, like, this is what they used to all be like, which is crazy powerful. Okay, we got that one, and that one, and that one, and now this is the only one we're missing. Flightless bird. I'm just going to look this up. I don't feel like... <laughs> Flightless bird. Elden Ring. Windmill Heights... Oh, the whole time I was like, what is the point of this area? And it's because that's where the flippin' painter is. One of the one of them. Okay. Alright, so let's go do this. Mm. It all makes sense. Back to Midsummer Village. Got him. There he is. Can't even see the flippin' earth tree, it's so foggy. Okay. All the paintings are done. I think all my outstanding quests are... done? Maybe? Let's head back here. And this time we'll take the low road. And then that bridge has a dragon on it. And we'll, we'll do that after. Okay. I guess we can go to Fort Faroth. Jay Lorecrafting again? Hell yeah. Look, I'm not constrained by the people who have put in insane amounts of hours into this. Okay? That's the thing. Some people have spent the last two years exclusively doing Elden Ring lore. And you know what? They have a lot of knowledge. I'd love to run things by them. But let me also say that they're the worst at coming up with interesting stuff. I don't know why that hurt me. I mean, I, I kind of know. It's like the, the system of the game sometimes is just a little funky with falls. Okay. No, we're still going down. Still got to keep going down. We're going down, down, and a little round. Sugar, we're going down, swinging. I'll be the number one with a bullet. Lonely God complex, cock it and pull it. 
going down, down. Going down, down. I also want to go and check the, the big tree, Melania's Scarlet Aonia tree, because, again, there's a possibility. Don't yell at me. There's a possibility there's something up there for me to get. Ooh. Okay, lingering hitbox? Much? Come on! Big bleeds. Big bleeds. That's what you get. I don't remember this area very well at all. There might be a dungeon. I'm pretty sure that there's a Knight's Cavalry around here, too. I think he's on the lower bridge. Is it nighttime? It's evening, so he should be showing up here. I could also just wait until nighttime. Boop. <laughs> just barely, barely moving the needle there. So if we go up, I think this is where the metal balls assail us. Oh, this leads... I see. This leads us back to the minor Erd tree, which you already did. Please. It's a good jump attack. Yes, okay, there is a cave here. Um, I guess let's do it, but we just want to make sure it's still nighttime when we come out. Dragon Barrow Cave. Bye, Char. Have a good night. Dude, what, am I supposed to sneak around this thing like an asshole? No, fuck you, rune bear. You think I'm scared of you? Do you know how many rune bears we've killed in this game? He doesn't know. He thinks, oh, the player, they're all scared of rune bears. He'll sneak around through the tall grass. No! This piece of shit has no idea what's coming. Oh, so scary. Oh, the rune bears. Oh, no. Hardest enemies in the game. No, they're not. They're not. Shut up. Stop saying that. They're not. Just messing around. If you think the rune bears are very difficult, I don't blame you. That's okay. You're allowed to think that. I apologize for being, uh... Rude about it. You are wrong, though. <laughs> okay, this is where we came from, right? Yeah. I want to say the boss here is double... Um it's double... For Amazula Beasts. Which, at this point in the game, we should be just fine against. Everyone thinks Rune Bears <coughs> are that way because they all watch Carbat animation? I would imagine that the Carbat animation is the way it is because of a popular sentiment that has spread regarding...
rune bears. My stream last night had a copyright hit because I guess I'm too good at Georgia on my mind. I thought I was doing the real thing. Dude, that wolf has so much health. Holy shit. Get out of here. It also feels a little telling that the boss is double beastmen in here. And it's like the cave is just chock full of beasts. Dude, did you see that Ash of War just demolish that thing? That's a good Ash of War. But it furthers my sus suspicion that the Beastmen um, were part of a society that was very, uh, it was like woo-woo with nature. It was like a beast kingdom. That's my thought. A copper attack for playing saxophone? That's inhuman? Yeah, a little bit. Still night time. Area of rolling. Yep. <laughs> Will do. I'll be honest, Dragon Barrow feels like a half finished zone just because there's only one side dungeon and it like it's mostly just Kaled, right? But it's listed as its own zone, it has its own map. Ferrum Great Bridge, by the way. Oop. Nope. Um, I'm gonna go kill this knight's cavalry because it's night time. Uh, I want to say this is the last one in the game, but that's not true. There are two in Consecrated Snowfields. I don't think there are any death birds in this zone, but I, I could look it up. Woo! Don't do it, bro. Fighting these guys on Torrent is fine, but it does take a long time.
But we should get some good bleeds with Morgoth's sword. got me there, Knight's Cavalry. You almost got me. Yes. No more, no more summoning new horses, okay? No more of that. Okay. Okay. I forgot about this one, where the door is just closed. There's no way to open it, basically. Ooh! Oh, we're, we're alive. We're not alive. <laughs> we technically made contact with the ground. That should not have killed us after, but again, that's just kind of how the game works. Sometimes... I just won't use a rune arc for now. By the way, I should still be—I should still be at least trying to co-op. It's gonna be really hard to find matches, but. I was gonna say, yeah, what if I just like drop down? What? This game, man. I don't agree with that. No, no, no. Don't, 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 don't! We're live. <gasps> there must be a better way to go. We just want to come up here and grab my runes. Then, let's go back down, I guess. is one of those things I just don't really remember. Maybe let's face a little closer towards the... Okay. Well... How'd you plan on hiding the fact that you're a good saxophone player? It's never meant to be hidden. I just didn't... I just don't really... talk about it. I used to play a lot more um, when I was younger, and then I stopped. Down. 
Oh my gosh, is it really that easy? <laughs> Have I ever shared my saxophone journey? Dude, music was like my life when I was in high school and early college. Everything I did was music related. I was in a fusion band. We had we played like real gigs and stuff. Like we were in high school, so it's not like we were incredible, but like I would say I was one of the best players of my age. Again, that's, you know, that's a big... It was a long time ago, so I think I, I don't have to necessarily be humble about it. Like, I wasn't like a child prodigy or anything, but of my peer group, I was definitely um, one of the best. Typically, in the groups I was in, I was the best. Um, so I did a ton of stuff musical-related, um, and I just had this terrible, terrible track record where I would come into a new organization i would do really well the per the administration the person in charge would put me in charge like not in charge but like first chair which in college at least first chair means you have to run your practice um groups and so in high school i got first chair in jazz band i got second chair in jazz band as a freshman which was typically a seniors only band the person who was third chair quit because of that Um, I joined a wind symphony. It was like a... It was like, I was in high school, but it was like for higher performing individuals. Um, can I open this? Or it just doesn't open at all? Um, it was for like higher performing individuals. Um, person who ranked below me in that quit. Get to college. I'm not a music major. I, in retrospect, maybe should have tried. But I'm like, I'm, I still want to do band, even though I've decided this isn't my life path. And... Um, I was the literally the only freshman in the entire band. I was in the highest tier band, concert band, in the university. And I placed first chair. Person underneath me quit so it was around this time I was getting v bad vibes from the other people in the alto sax section I was a freshman I didn't have a lot of confidence in how to lead the group nor did it feel like they were interested in you know having to listen to me not that I really need to give orders but even just being like hey let's show up on this date at this time and practice our stuff and, again, I was really young. I was, like, 19. And you have these people who are upperclassmen, seniors and juniors, who clearly were not happy that I was in this position. And so after two semesters, I quit. Um, and I think it was also just sort of a culmination of these other times in the past where I felt like these other people had quit. Which, again, that's their problem, not mine. But I think this kind of broke the camel's back a little bit because I thought, like, this person who quit was, like, a music major and I was not. So I feel like I, like, derailed their life path. And, again, I understand that's not my problem, but I couldn't help, and I still kind of can't help but feel bad about that. And so, basically, I, my takeaway was, if you want to play an instrument in college, it has to be external to the institution. If you want to play music in college, you need to find a band or a group outside of the school or join a, or like purposefully place into a lower level one that is meant for less serious people. And um cuz again, I was just surrounded by people who were like this is my this is my I want this to be my career and I'm in just in there like I just like to play. And I think that they were I, they were not happy about that. I didn't I never, like, antagonized that, but, like, that's just... I think they just knew that that, you know, I wasn't a music major. And, again, I was young, and I just don't think I took it seriously enough as I should have anyway, even though I wasn't a music major. And so, yeah, then I quit. And then as I got older, um, I was, like, I exclusively lived in apartments, and it just never felt appropriate to play a loud... I want to say wind instrument, but, like, a saxophone is probably one of the loudest wind instruments... 
So like, it's not quite a brass instrument, but it's it's loud, and there's not like a there's not a great way. Like you don't want like you can't just like oh I'm gonna practice quietly. Like that's just not really how it works. Um, I mean I can practice quietly, but like I want to be able to like actually practice. So you know I just kind of went through my adult life and just stopped playing. Like I had the I had the horn. I I always had it, but I just never like I just never really played it. And I always thought, like, oh, I should, I should, I should, I should, I should, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? You know how it goes. You think, like, oh, it's here. Now it's time. I should pick it back up. And then I never did. And um, I just want to pop all these now while I'm already poisoned. Um, and then I never really did. And, um, I'm not really sure what changed, but just earlier this year, I told my wife, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna... I think I'm gonna take, I'm like, sign up for lessons. And a big part of it, too, it's similar to, like, when you're, when you want to start, like, a weight loss journey. You're like, well... No matter what progress you make, it just doesn't feel like enough. Which is, a, you know... A huge mental barrier that you have to be cognizant of. Dude, there's so many of these poison things. I'm just gonna accept that I'll be poisoned through this section. Um, so, like, that's part of it, too, is because I, I never really had the time to put in consistently, and I thought, like, well, you know, I, I lack the structure that I need for this. I'm like, oh, I could pick it up and I could play a little bit, but it just never felt like I would ever get better again. And, um... So that's why I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna... I'm gonna spring for it. Got the money. I'm gonna... I'm gonna hire an instructor. Because my... Again, my biggest issue is just like... I didn't have the... Direction. The, the structure that I needed. For like, practice regimens. And so now... It also adds that tiny bit of pressure. Like, hey, make sure you practice. Because you're gonna see this person once a week. And you don't want to be like... Oh, I didn't... I didn't practice at all this week. <laughs> um... So that's been incredibly helpful. And so that's been my that's been my saxophone journey. So I basically went about 15 years barely playing. And when I say barely, I mean like maybe once or twice a year I'd pick it up. And I'd dabble a little bit and that's when I'd be like, "Ah, you know, it's been too long. I think you know, this is a nice decoration that maybe I could donate one day." But now again, it's it's kind of, it, instruments can be kind of like riding a bike in the sense that like the knowledge is always there like once it's internalized you can pick it back up and play it's not going to be with the same skill and that's what you need to practice for but like i'm i'm getting back you know i'm not quite where i was when i was younger but like i'm you know i'm getting back there it feels good and i would say like the big thing too with all of that with you know music in a general sense is playing an instrument or really just music in general, has, was like a huge part of my identity. Like, love for music. And it just sort of disappeared very abruptly when I was younger. And it just is one of those things that feels like it never was refilled. So now it feels really good to be able to kind of get back in that groove. And I don't want to say that that's why maybe I've slowed down on videos or anything, but it is, you know, one more thing where every day I do want to practice a little bit. And then on Saturdays I have a lesson. So it's like, you know, that's just more on the schedule. So, you know, maybe I did fill that gap that I was talking about not filling previously. Maybe I did fill that with my YouTube channel. I don't know. I mean, my YouTube channel, at like, recording video, I don't want to say the channel, but, like, recording videos has always filled kind of a, a slot in my life that is there sort of, like, be fulfilling and be stimulating and sort of, and just, like, reduce boredom. And I realized that music um, did a lot of that when I was in, when I was younger, like, probably up until the age of about 21. And, um...
Because I was in the band, and I think I, I think I quit the band when I was 19, and then I still played for a few years just on my own, but it just never, again, it just kind of lacked the structure, and it just became less and less and less. got me. No! Get the fruit out. Have some raisins, buddy. You're great. Keep it up. You're a good horse. Ox thing. Don't let anyone tell you different. Oh, okay. That reached way further than I expected, but all right. Oh my gosh, there's dog hair on my controller. Coco! It's distracting me. Uh-oh. That's a hard one to avoid. It can be, at least. Yeah, I'll chance it. Okay, we're good. I was about to say, is that all the dragon hearts in the game? And it is absolutely not. Is there some unconsecrated snow fields? Maybe mountaintops? I don't think so, though. That saxophone is a woodwind? Yeah, it is. I, I just meant that in terms of like how much noise you make with it, it's it's not quite brass, but it's more comparable to brass in terms of yeah, how much how loud it is. So like when I, I just you know, I lived in New York, like very highly dense area. I mean, everywhere I lived, I would feel uncomfortable practicing an instrument that I couldn't play electronically and mute all external noise. Like a keyboard, you could put headphones in, right? You don't need a piano, you can do a keyboard or you can do a drum set that like, if you wear headphones that you plug them in and then it sounds, you know, you can hear yourself playing the instrument but no one else really hears you playing the instrument. But there isn't really an equivalent. Oh, there might be, I think there is an equivalent like that for saxophone, but when I was younger, I don't think that existed. And even still, I, I, it's just not the same. I guess probably keyboard users would say the same thing, or drum set users would say the same thing. So I would just say for instruments, it's not the same if you can't just fucking belt, you know? Like when we play in a little bit here. Again, that's and that's one of the things I've been working on with my instructor. Is she's just like you just need to you just need to play louder. She's, I mean, she, she tells me all right. She's like, I can tell that you're concerned about playing too loud. Just play louder. And like, I am a, you know, I think that I'm a big fan of, um, dynamics, like get very quiet, get very loud, get very quiet. Like you can use that to do some really cool stuff. Um, but I think in general, you know, I err on the side of sort of like me, like mediocre to quiet playing. And she's like, no, no, just... <laughs> Just play louder, it'll be fine. <laughs> Part of that might be my microphone, though, which I have set up to stop peaking. So, like, my microphone will only pick up a certain, a certain decibel. And then it will kind of... It's not a compressor, technically, but it will... It basically functions the same way. Where it'll stop things from getting too loud so that they don't peak. And so... Maybe I just need to 
use a different microphone or actually increase the gain, but remember to turn it back for when I'm recording videos. Kukri. Kukri. I said it's Kukri. Kukri. But there's a few things. I mean, uh, in general, I feel like it's it's just been really helpful because, again, it sort of is filling back up that spiritual gap, for lack of a better term, that I think that I that sort of opened up. But then also, um, ow. You know, it is it is a big confidence booster because it's something I was always good at that I just sort of you know, stopped doing. It was something I took a lot of pride in, and then it was like, oh, I guess I just don't do that anymore. Um. <clears throat> so, like, it's cool to see a lot of the, the compliments I got from you all, which is very nice. I am far from professional. Um. And then the other thing, too, is, like, I kind of want to work towards being able to just sort of jam... Like, a lot of this stuff that I was working on last night, it's because, you know, I practice this a lot, and every good musician practices so much, like, so, so, so much, such that when they do perform, you think that they're, you know, just like this impeccable talent when in, re like, I mean, that is true, but it's because they practice for hours and hours and hours, and all the stuff that sounds bad happens during the practicing, and then when they perform it, you're like, oh, that's really nice. So, like... I think one thing that I'm sort of trying to get over is this idea that, like, it from that perspective, you want to sort of craft something that's, like, perfect or, like, well put together. When in reality, I sort of instead would much rather learn how to sort of go with the flow. Like, if you drop, like, a basic backtrack, I could just sort of jam with it. I would love to get to that point. Um, that's not simple, especially not for me, who, like, again, I'm already pretty predisposed to sort of being quiet and more laid back. And I just need to get to the point where I just, like, don't give a fuck. And I'm just, you know, blasting away. And as the, as the best musicians, as the best jazz musicians might say, there are no wrong notes. <laughs> and uh, that's, I would love to get to that point where it's just kind of about confidence. You're playing loud, and if you hit wrong notes, it's not about stopping and acknowledging, oh, I messed up. You just roll with it, man. Just go chromatically up or down, it'll be fine. Is there anything over here? Improv is always hard. And yeah, I think that's my struggle with it, is it, it feels very hard to me as well. And I keep thinking like, I need, I just need a stronger foundation, I need to learn every scale, I need to learn every minor scale, I need to learn every mode, and then I'll feel so comfortable, and it's muscle memory, that I can just think of a chord and just, you know, play something cool. When in reality, I think it's just like, you just gotta do it. Like, you just gotta play a lot, and you just gotta feel good about what you're playing, you have to hear yourself play good things, and hear yourself play bad things, and you just sort of select from those things and it becomes more, you just become more attuned to it. And then you add more music theory knowledge on top of that, and you refine it, and it gets better. And then you add more mechanical or, or technical skill, I should say, to it. And it just, you know, it improves from there. And I'm stuck in this, uh, this idea where I'm like, it should be like, you know, I need to do all that stuff first. And then I'll be fully prepared to really know how to improvise, and it's like, I don't think it's really about that. I think improvising is just about sort of a... Oh, I mean, it's a mix. I think there's two angles, and depend and it's just like, depending on the person you are is where you need to start. And for me, yeah, I just not... Uh, I'm someone who just sort of feels like, I don't want to play the wrong note, so I need to learn everything just right. Otherwise, it's not going to sound good, and I, I... I don't know if that's really the right mindset that I should be having. So I'm trying to shake that. And again, the goal is eventually to get to a point where I can just do sort of a jam. 
That would be, I would really like that. You know, you'd lay down a fairly simple backtrack and I can just play something that sounds, it doesn't have to be incredible, but just something where I just feel like, I feel good doing. This dude's been here for a long time, so we're finally going to kill him. I was really hoping that would get a stagger. How do you think it's going to be a StarCraft 3? I love your custom campaign playthroughs. Well, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm like 95% confident there will not be a StarCraft 3. And even if there was, is it, I mean, do you want one? Like, maybe StarCraft 2 is good enough. I don't know. I don't think we need another one. I'll be honest, I, I feel like like StarCraft 2, for example, didn't even, didn't need to be StarCraft. It could have been anything. Got just another... I don't know, the way, God, I, like, I clearly rolled through that! I knew that I, when I was jumping, I was screwed. Basically, my thought is, with a lot of older games where people really want sequels, the original talent that made it, God, it, the original talent that made it is gone. Like, they don't, they don't work there anymore. So it's kind of like... I guess someone new can make it, but, like, it's not going to be the same thing. They can slap the same name on it, but it's not the same. I feel that way about StarCraft 2. I like playing StarCraft 2, but at the same time, like, it, it, it's inc it feels incredibly different. I'm going to say, we got Nephili Lou. Let's get her out. Wait, did I lose all my runes? I think I did. Oh no, okay, I picked him up. I can't see anything. This is stupid. This is the only thing about world bosses, is just like the arena I mean, there is no arena. I guess that's the point. You also love how everything that does a spin attack in this game does two spins just because they want to fuck you. Like, they just... They know, and they're just like, Here, here's a second spin. Because, of course, there'll be a second spin. Dude, Nephili Lou's actually, like, legit great. See how he... You know? Even if I spammed a double roll, I wouldn't have uh, been able to survive that. Dude, she's she's murdering him. Great work, Nephili. I didn't think she'd be this good, okay? I knew she was good, but I didn't think she would be this good. Holy shit. I just wanted to summon her because I'm like, yeah, we haven't used her. Oh my gosh. The hardest part of improv is getting over the anxiety of improv. 
of getting comfortable hearing yourself experiment and make mistakes and successes. I think part of it too is like I mostly hear mistakes. <laughs> And then what I'll do is I'll plan out something very specific in my mind, and then I will take time to be able to put it into the instrument, and then it sounds good. So I've never had a moment where I'm just, like, trying to jam, and then something comes out, and I'm like, oh, shit! <laughs> Unless it's very simple. Like, if it's just, like, a blue scale, that's it's easy. You know, I can just jam on a blue scale. Easy peasy. It's just, like, putting in cool syncopations and, and rhythms and stuff. Let's go get the Cinque Dea or whatever it's called. Here we go. Okay. This can be a little painful to get, and I probably shouldn't have popped a rune arc because there's a good chance we will die again. Speaking of rune arcs, let's just keep doing this. I guess the question was, do I think there'll be a StarCraft 3? And my answer is no. Um, but, like, just an addendum onto that answer, like, why am I cynical about that, is more just, like, my personal feelings about... a lot of, like, the nostalgia hits and stuff, is it just feels... it feels kind of cheap. Again, it's like taking a name that people recognize, and it's like, again, think like, Star I'm not saying StarCraft II shouldn't have existed. Quite the contrary. But it's so drastically different compared to Brood War, where it's like, you could have made StarCraft II and made it its new, like a new IP, and just made the units look different, and it would have been great. And I think then you, but it's just like, hey, we'll get more people to buy this if it's StarCraft. Also, to be fair, StarCraft had a longer story to be told, so, you know. Hey. Okay, thanks. This person must be on New Game Plus. This thing has a lot of health. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is I wish that there was, you know, a little more judiciousness around both a new sequel sequels for things existing in the first place and then also sort of a fan demand for it i think that it could be better if we were a little more like hey you know maybe this is just good like i'm good with the 1999 version because i you know there's a concern that if they try to make a sequel to this it's go it's just going to be bad it's just going to be bad and i'm not going to enjoy it it's going to ruin the not only will it ruin this game for me, but it's going to, like, ruin my perception of the old stuff, too. People say that this happens for them with Star Wars. I mean, I disagree that anything could possibly be so bad that, like, now suddenly the Empire Strikes Back is no longer good to you. You're, like, actually insanely stupid if that if that's, you know, that's just, that's not real. I mean, I've gone on, like, huge rants about media criticism as well so i this is kind of rich for me to say like oh just don't ask for things that you think you want so that you don't get disappointed but in a way that is kind of what i'm saying <laughs> everyone was so excited about warcraft 3 reforge Ooh, it's gonna tie the knot with wow look at these you know new graphics and the new cinematics it's like how come how can't why aren't we allowed to just be like you know what the old cinematics are fine what about that
And just like, be fine with those. There's something about this idea that like, because now we have the technology, we can reimagine things to show all the stuff our imagination cr had to do in the past. What if we redid, what if we were able to show the Battle of Endor from, you know, and show like a much larger space battle and it's like, look, it's one of the most memed on quotes in the PC gaming community, but it's one of those things I truly think it's like, you think you want this, but like when you see what you might get from asking for it, you might stop wanting it. You think you want it, but you don't. Um, sometimes, actually most of the time, your imagination, even in the face of the incredible technology we have today, is going to do a better job than a team of, you know, 30 animators who get paid $150,000 a year so that they can make one five-minute space battle scene. I just, <laughs> I, like, truly... I just, I just think we're in this mode now where it's like, well, this was old, and we could, like, we could, if we put our minds to it, we could make something so much cooler now. And it's like, yeah, you know what else can for free? Your imagination. And that was the thing about older games, and that was the charm to older games. For me, was they forced you to have an imagination. And now it feels like a lot of people don't even fully understand how to engage their imagination. And if they're not shown or told something directly, then they're like incapable of using their imagination. And that is bizarro land to me. Um, there's so much good media that is based off of forging like implications and using your imagination to fill in the gaps, which is what we had to do when we were younger. But now, if you, uh, it just feels like if, you're, if you ask people to do that, they, they, they can't. They, like, can't. Actually can't. Or, or maybe they can't, and they'll be sort of upset that you asked them to. <laughs> Thanks, Soft Cotton. And I think there are plenty of good examples to this, but it's why when I watched Star Wars, Empire, and Return of the Jedi when I was like eight, or maybe a little older, those movies came out in 1979. Or the original Star Wars was 1979. That was probably almost two decades before I watched it. And yet, it's like timeless. And it's because there were effects that were believable enough that you could engage your imagination and have fun with it. And by thinking that we, like the hubris to think that you could take lightning in a bottle and just like re-bottle it, repackage it so that like it's better now is insane to me. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. It might be why StarCraft Remastered is considered one of the most successful remasters. And it, because it changed virtually nothing. Very, very little did it change. Exact same art style, just upscaled to run on newer resolutions. Where's that Chinquidea? I want it! Do I just drop from here? This doesn't seem right. I think we can do this. It's not much better, but like... Okay, this is fine. Now we fall. <laughs> Floating on nothing, but you know. Anyway, this has been my rant about nostalgia traps.
And like, look, some stuff gets remade and it's great. But do you really want to take that chance? <laughs> do you? That being said, a lot of the shit that comes out, it's not that bad. I don't think it's as bad as the feedback usually is, but the fact that the feedback is so overblown and ridiculous just goes to show how close people hold these things to their hearts. And I just think like, oh no, The Force Awakened came out and it was like fun to go and see in the theater once and forget about in a week. And you're like, okay, it was like a popcorn flick. It was a blockbuster hit. And it was one of the best selling movies of all times but at the time it was the highest that's since been surpassed but still like you know in retrospect it receives a lot of criticism now similar like last jedi and rise of skywalker like people hate these things they loathe these things with their core beings and that's the kind of shit where it's like you know maybe we just didn't need these movies <laughs> All the people that hate those movies now, at one point, wanted them. They wanted them. And that's the thing. Maybe we need to temper our expectations and say, you know what? Maybe we don't want those things because the potential for it to be not good is high enough based on, you know, the track record of remakes and whatever these days where it's like, you know what? Maybe we just say no thanks to this one. That would be okay. I'm not crazy. This actually looks like a piece of Faramazula. Yeah, it, I mean, the Beast Sanctum, this is, a, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, and then Malekith being here, obviously. Um, yeah, Bestial Sanctum, I think, is heavily implied to have been connected or very heavily associated with Faramazula. In my opinion, and, you know, one of the common theories is this whirlpool right here was Faramazula. It was connected to this divine tower and it bridged the gap between for, um, between mountaintops of the giants and um, and Caleb with bestial sanctum because the architecture here is the same and this is literally called the Ferrum Great Bridge. My niece and nephew don't really know how to engage with a story. They can't read more than a few hundred words, and then they think they just think I could have just watched a TV show or scrolled through TikTok. You don't know, but I'm talking about adults. <laughs> I'm not talking about kids. Kids and, like, their attention spans and what they're able to engage with is totally different. I'm talking, like, you're a 35-year-old man, like myself, and I'm thinking, man, what if they make an... What if they make a, an episode 10? And I just think, like, eh, maybe. Like, I guess I'll go and watch it with my friends because we go and see movies fairly frequently. But I don't think, like... <gasps> Nor do I think, oh, how dare they? And I just think if, like, both camps in there need to temper their expectations or just sort of, like, get over themselves a little bit. I don't know. I guess I've just never been, like, a super hype person. Like, I guess, I don't know. I'm hyped about Shadow of the Erd Tree, but that's because this company has been without fail super, like, it's been a hit for me every single time. I don't know, and maybe it's because I got burned by the prequels when I was a lot younger, too, where I'm like, you know, there's a good chance this just isn't going to be good, so I'm just not going to get my hopes up, and then I'll watch it, and maybe it will be good. I don't know. And I'm going to be real with you. Look, you want, you want one of my hottest, one of my spiciest media takes? I like The Last Jedi. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. It was fine. I think... There were some really excellent things that went on in that film. There were also some pretty poor things that went on in that film. If you put them together, you get a perfectly fine movie. It introduced some new ideas, which would have been cool to explore, that were since dropped because enough people were poo-pooed about it. I'm not out here to defend The Last Jedi. I don't give a shit if you like or dislike it. But <laughs> my take is it was fine. But that's kind of my take with most media. It's just like if it's something where... If you ever, in your life, have consumed a piece of media meant for leisure and entertainment and said, I must go and leave a one-star review for this, I must do it, then something is wrong with you. <laughs> like, deep down, 
there's like a hole in your soul that is slowly eating away at you if if you must do that. <laughs> I'm not saying get over everything that disappoints you immediately, but there's like a level of retribution and entitlement that people have. Like the Mass Effect 3 endings, great example. People lost their minds. I felt unfulfilled by that as well, and I understand people like build an emotional connection to these fake characters. Fine. But like, chill. Like, you're on the freeway, and some, it's a 65 mile an hour speed limit road. Someone's in the right lane going exactly 65. Someone's in the left lane going 70, and you want to go 75. It's that same feeling where some people, they're like, well, I wish I could go faster. This is a bit frustrating. I acknowledge that, but I can't do anything about that, so I'll just wait. I'm not happy about it, but I'll wait. And then you have the other person who tailgates and road rages and causes hazards on the road. It's the same idea with people who watch The Rise of Skywalker, admittedly not a great film, and think, all right, like, I don't demand my two and a half hours back, but I didn't love that, versus someone who goes insane. Paragraphs upon paragraphs of... of forum knowledge dumping and and critic and like amateur critique and basically will f go to any length to have their opinion validated and if it's not then who boy watch out because you are enemy number one if you try and tell someone that their media take is uninformed or like is going too far and that i've said this before it's a cardinal sin if someone comes to you and they're like hey i have a problem i don't feel good about this thing and you're like that's not a real problem. Just get over it because it's not a real problem. And you think you're helping by giving them some sort of reality check. That's literally like the, the social cardinal sin. <laughs> never do that if it's someone you care about. No matter what they're coming to you from, if you care about that person, never, ever do that. But on the internet, no one knows each other. We're all strangers. So everybody does this to each other literally 100% of the time. <laughs> I'm like not exaggerating. It's like 99% of all interaction on the internet are people who are like, I don't care what you're saying. I, there's no need for me to go out of my way to like think about how you care about this thing, so fuck you. And I'm kind of doing it myself in this, own, in this rant where I'm just like telling people like, fucking get over it. But I'm not telling an individual specific person to. So I think that sort of dulls it a bit. But like, yeah, I think some people, they just, they're just, it's too much. It's too much. What's going on in your life such that The Last Jedi is the thing you really care about? Like, so much that it's, you're, it's giving you, like, a momentary meltdown. Also, hello, Brett. I saw you earlier. I, thank you for being here. I think there's an emotional component where people feel personally attacked and robbed of their time by consuming media they don't enjoy. I agree with the personally attacked part. I don't agree with the, like... I don't think anybody literally leaves a theater and thinks, man... I wish I was at home. I could have been doing chores instead of watching this movie. Um, I don't know. I, if you're someone who isn't like goes a little crazy about media like this, you ain't got nothing better to do. Like by definition, it's not like if you were at home, you would have been doing something more important. <laughs> okay, you can go home and you can scroll through Instagram and watch your stupid YouTube stuff when you get home. And it would be the same as if you stayed home. Those two and a half hours are going into a black hole vortex that you'll never get back in any case. If you are someone who this becomes a whole thing for you. <laughs> but you know, look, I've been disappointed by media before too. Don't get me wrong. I've been there. It's just, I f there's again, there's like the, the response. It's like, it's, it's, I'll say it again. It's vindictive and it's entitled and it grosses me out. The internet is built for these sorts of cardinal sins? Absolutely. Um, I think we're done with Dragon Barrow. Very exciting stuff. Um, what does that leave? Noxtella and Mountaintops of the Giants. Mountaintops, potentially one of the least fun areas of the game. Let me go leave a one-star review. Um, yeah, okay. So let's do Angel River Main and then... Lake of Rot and keep going with Ronnie's quest. And I'm going to go get something to drink. And I'm going to chill out because I don't want to...
I don't want to lose my mind. Jay, if every piece of media takes that as an example, you'd never get another Empire or another Elden Ring. If you decide not to have standards, why would they make good stuff? You'll buy it. Look, there's a difference between expressing something that you liked or disliked and losing your mind. <laughs> okay? You can give feedback. You know what prompts something like Elden Ring getting made is Elden Ring selling a lot of copies. Not people leaving good or bad reviews. That's why, even though Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker were panned by audiences... Well, Rise of Skywalker had a higher audience score, but a lower critic score, and Last Jedi was flipped. Higher critic score, lower audience score. But they weren't, in general, received very well in retrospect. They're making more Star Wars. Because people will watch it no matter how much they complain. You might hemorrhage a few people... But in reality, all those people complaining and they go and they'll review bomb will still watch the next thing. That's, that's another reason why it can be a bit frustrating. So the really good stuff does float to the top because it will continue to sell like Elden Ring or other games that I could mention. But like, I don't know. I, there's just like, it, there's, a, there's a threshold and the internet has so fundamentally changed the way we interact with each other that it's so easy to breach the threshold, like, every time. Literally every piece of media, no matter how well critically it's received, there will be people who, met, like, literally have, like, full-on meltdowns about it. They're, it's not like their life is ruined, but they will, there will be a temporary meltdown that, like, destroys their life for a, for a period of time. It's, <laughs> it's crazy to me. Like, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I know you all have seen how this goes. <laughs> And, yeah, I mean, I, I know, I understand the argument about standards, but... Again, I'm not saying don't have standards. I'm saying you can express those standards and a desire for them in a way that doesn't... doesn't make us all insane. If people didn't complain about stuff that, that didn't work about DS2, do you think DS3 would have been as good as it was? Uh, yes. <laughs> because the game director was straight up different. <laughs> I don't know if that was necessarily a response to the reception. Maybe it was. But, um... Again, I don't know. I, I feel like we're, we all understand this, and maybe we're just arguing, like, not really semantics per se, but, like, maybe it's just becoming pedantic. Like, there's a difference between you see a movie, you go and watch fucking Godzilla versus Kong, and you think, I love Godzilla. God, I love Godzilla so much. I love those movies. And it doesn't meet your expectations. Because those movies are schlock. But you know what? They're probably like... You know, 5 out of 10. They're not great. But like, they're fine. So what happens is people will take... A 
5 out of 10, or maybe 4 out of 10 experience, and it becomes a 1 out of 10. And I just feel like all, all critical thought about these things goes out the window. And I think if you're someone, again, who feels that drive to essentially join in on a review bomb, like, you're not, you're not really contributing much. Like, I don't think DS2 needs to be review bombed for the sequel to improve on things that people didn't like. Like, arguably, I think Elden Ring is better than Dark Souls 3 in many ways. But I don't think it was because of, like, it wasn't because of criticism of Dark Souls 3 necessarily. I guess it could have been. But, like, again, you can see things get better without them being so heavily crit critiqued to the point of absurdity. And I think maybe that's that's probably where the, the root of my absurd complaints comes from. Is it just... It feels like everything is either a, a 1 or a 8, 9, 10. There's no in-between anymore. You, there, it can't be... like Because it's, it's your favorite franchise, right? You can't have a Star Wars movie that's only a 6 out of 10. That's not allowed. It's either a 10 out of 10 or it's the worst thing that's ever existed. There's no in-between anymore. The Last Jedi is not a 1 out of 10 movie. If you think Last Jedi is, like, the worst movie ever made, then, like, you just haven't seen a lot of movies. Like, you just don't understand what bad filmmaking truly is. Is it a 10 out of 10? No, I don't think anybody would say that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Ryan Johnson, but, like... I don't know. I think people be tripping. That's really it. I need to sit at the grace so that Ronnie will speak to me. Now let's go this way. I don't know. I, I old Jay Barino, like twenty twenty. 18-ish Jay Barino had this argument a lot, and it always gets misconstrued as basically saying, like, have no standards. <laughs> like, I, I would never say that. I just think that, again, it's really the internet has so fundamentally changed the way that we interact with media and with each other, and it's almost like people sort of know this, but it's never really been examined deeply to the point where there's just so much we sort of understand about how we talk with people online that it it's just I would I think I mean I don't know I wasn't alive however long ago but like probably similar to like the industrial revolution it so vastly changed how society functions in like a general sense and it's just like this goofy little microcosm about movie criticism sure but I think it it allows for the validation of opinions that like look it's like a meme I think it's a 2024 meme or like early 2020s meme like bring back bullying <laughs> And the the point the meaning behind that is not like we should make people feel bad at every turn, but I think shame, peer shame is valuable in certain instances. I think there's certain opinions that should be shamed that really it, it they just sort of naturally get filtered out in like day to day real life interactions. Like, I could say this pile, this dead Clayman pile, is the sexiest thing I've seen in my life. And most people would think, like, well, that's crazy. What are you talking about, you weirdo? And that's, again, it would filter that opinion out really quick. Maybe I'd still think it, but I wouldn't share it, and it just wouldn't be a prominent thing that's ever really discussed. But sure, what the internet allows for is, for the four to five other people in the world that think that we can now validate each other's opinions and that opinion then no longer properly 
properly, gets filtered out. I do not believe that every single thought that pops in every single person's head is necessarily valid or needs to be validated. That's the job of the people that are close to you in life that you respect, you know, and that's how we generally form our opinions is how those people around us interact with us as well. So, like, if you have something that sort of fits outside that, there's, like, an element of peer pressure that stops you from deviating too far from the norm to be sort of disruptive. And the Internet stops that process to an extent. And I feel like this is something that's largely not been examined. But it's also why people are able to be pulled farther and farther to the extreme. Because no matter what your opinion is, when you're... Look, when you're like 18, you're allowed to have some wacky opinions, man. It's just, again... There are... Dude, this thing's like at the longest delay of my life. Like, you're supposed to have wacky opinions when you're 18. You're 18. You're supposed to be passionate, and you're supposed to have sort of, like, underbaked, but very passionate feelings about a lot of stuff. That's okay. But, I never spoke to Ronnie at the Grace. Is there another one up here? But, like, that's the point of, like, learning and growing, is that sort of gets filtered out, and you sort of get pulled a little bit closer to sort of the peer group opinions. That's normal. But now, no matter how crazy your beliefs are, and how inexperienced you might be, there are people out there who will tell you, like, you're, you've got the right idea going on. And that's, uh, that's concerning. I think that's what leads to some real weird stuff. And that's what... That's what gets people into extremist camps. The need for validation, the root of all evil. Um, if, I mean, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just peop it's just how people. It's just how people are. Like that's just your emotions. Like when you are feeling bad, as many people will at some point in their life, <laughs> as most everyone will at some point in their life. It generally makes you feel better when someone's there for you. But again, when you extend this to literally every thought that goes through my head has to, like, I can't, I'm not allowed to be challenged or judged about these things. Again, we took this element of, like, this idea that, like, again, this sort of, like, demonizing of, like, feeling bad through adversity, like, Demonizing that has, is, like, a huge, huge problem, and it's sort of happened naturally through... I think there was a, a way down here with the ants. I'll just go back. Um, it's just sort of through the internet, again, if you feel bad about something, and you're going through that struggle of, like, you shared an opinion, or someone, again, didn't validate how you felt about something, rather than processing that yourself... You seek out validation because you know there are people you can connect with somewhere in the world of our 7 billion people who will be like, it's all right, bro. Don't worry. It, whatever they said, that's, you know. But I think, again, up until the internet, we were structured to function in peer groups that interact in real life, like in your community. Now... <laughs> Not so much. I don't know. I think it's just sort of... It's a fascinating topic. I've always felt that online radicalization is one of the most interesting topics of our time. How does it happen? It's when people are in very specific emotional states. And nobody, literally nobody, myself included, is absolved from this. It, you think you might be the smartest person on the planet, but again, when you're in a specific mindset, you really don't know 
what you might be susceptible to. The whole point of being emotionally vulnerable is you're going to do things that, when you're not emotionally vulnerable, you'd think, oh, I would never do that. But it's like, it's kind of like how cults work, right? The people, there are people who are predisposed to being vulnerable to these things because they're in a place in their life where something is missing. They're not getting what they need and they're, and they're going to be opposed to a lot of institutional systems that just have failed them up until that point. So that person's in a mindset where they're more likely to believe in I mean, you name it. <laughs> and that's how people might join a cult. Yeah, and you look at that externally and you think, wow, that person's just stupid. And I disagree. I actually think that people, given their experience and state of mind, are acting exactly how... Like, they're acting pretty logically based on their starting mindset. They're acting exactly how you would expect someone in that mindset to behave. And, like, you never know. You have a bad year, bad month, whatever. You just have bad experiences in your life. You could be there, too. I could be there, too. That's the scary part. The best you can do is just sort of be aware of the possibility instead of just assuming that anybody who ever joins a cult is stupid. Um, maybe understand, like, there's a reason this stuff happens. There are, you know, there's a specific type of person in a specific type of mindset who is just vulnerable to it. And I think anybody could be. It's, I just think it's very interesting. Okay, now... Okay, I see where we are. We're above Ainsel Well. Okay, so we don't need to... Yeah, we're done up here. We can go back. We can go back to here. Jade, is it starting to sound like how you didn't find validation for your ideas of an acad academic discourse on crackpot theories when I read it and then you came to us for validation? You're absolutely right. I wouldn't deny that. My argument in that case was more so, too, that... <clears throat> I mean, again, this is just th sort of the, the validation of the opinion of... It's not so much the validation of my opinion about the lore theory. It was the unwillingness to engage with the presentation. Like, clearly... If... Someone is coming to you in a specific mindset or, or with a specific idea in mind. You want to try and meet that person where they're at. And that's when it, it's frustrating when you don't feel like you're understood. Because, again, you're being interpreted through like an entirely different lens that you presented. And that's how that felt. So, you come, so then you come here and you're like, well, my complaint isn't that they're not listening to my theory. It's that they're interpreting it through a lens that it was never intended to be... Interpreted through, not because I didn't think about it, but because, like, that's that wasn't the point of the discussion. But yeah, it's the same idea. I forget if we want to go up first. Like how they've bewitched the giant ants. You need to go backwards to fight Baleful? Well, we're in Noxtella now. I guess we can go back. Ow. Dude, this guy's got two shields? Holy shit, that's crap. That's actually like a cool setup. You were supposed to fight it right before you got to Noxtella, but... Oh, it didn't trigger. Okay. I... 
don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's right, it's like right before Lake of Rot, but I will go back. I mean, ultimately, it's a communication issue. The, the way I always think of it, the way I think of it, try to now, is like, it's a desire to meet people where they're at. And it's like, if you know you're not there, then like, almost don't even bother. Or at least you have to acknowledge where that person is at and then go from there. Of the demigods. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers, which is when I received blood. But I would not. I stole. I would not. The two fingers and the bale. I turned my the bale okay. I turned my back. The bale force. I think it's just, it's just what I've experienced as I've gotten older too. I just think it's sometimes folks go through this like. This thought that, like, we just need to be truth-seeking. The truth is out there. I think, I, I agree that, like, yes, the truth is out there. We should look for it. But, like, that doesn't reflect the reality of how people interact. And no matter how much people think that they want to be objective, perfectly objective robots, that's just not, that's just not how human interaction works. A lot of it, too, is, like, the simplicity. Like, I think what frustrates people, too, is there's, like, a... There's a terseness or a combativeness where you might feel a very certain way about something and then someone comes along and is like, that was just... This is bad. What are you talking about? It's just bad. And you're like, okay, well... <laughs> um, I don't know how to engage with this, but thanks for... Like, it's just insulting. Like, because what happens is... It's... I think... This can turn into a specific type of insult because you say, well, what you've done is you've made the, th the media part of your personality. Therefore, when someone insults it, you take it as an insult to your character. But I think it's a lot simpler than that, actually. I think it's just because the person is just expressing that they're not willing to cr communicate with you or respect what you said. And by just being very short and not, like, actually speaking with you about a specific topic, they're just... It's just, it is, it's just like straight up insulting to you, the person. It's not about the opinion per se, it's just, again, the internet facilitates this sort of shittiness that people will have towards each other over specific opinions. I love these ant mounts. Not that much though, because I still killed that one. I know we have to go up, but let's do that later. I guess let's stay along the bottom first. Objectivity and versus subjectivity, you really need both for human discourse. I mean, that's probably the most concise way to put it. I think you have people who are strongly in only one camp or the other versus just sort of understanding there is such a strong emotional element to how we interact with each other and you just have like you want to be cognizant of it not to the point of having anxiety about it um but like just understand that like how you respond to someone isn't just about how you feel about the thing they're saying it's about how they will feel about how you are interacting with them about it and i again the internet kind of dumbs it down to the point where you don't feel like you're interacting with another person so that's very rarely taken into consideration and there's just such, there's a, a low attention span that comes along with it where if you type too much with the intent of trying to be thoughtful, then people just don't read it. It's just, it's just set up for failure, like fundamentally with the way that um, I think the internet works. Like, 
if there's a forum that specifically exists where the main sentiment is like movie criticism on like a technical level, like veterans, the people who have worked in the industry who like want to have sort of like a professional take on film, then if you go into that forum and you give like a, you know, a more of like a heartfelt take, then like you're not really meeting that place where it's at in the first place. And then you're going to probably get a response that's a bit insulting because they're not going to meet you where you're at. And then again, you're just going to sort of have a bad interaction. <laughs> And I think, like, real-life discourse is so much easier to sort of interpret those things because we have so many snails. Because we have body language, we have facial expressions. There's so much when it comes to face-to-face -face interaction that plays into it. And when you just remove all that, no questions asked, like, you're sort of fucked. Like, you just lose so many elements to the interaction that you lose a lot of the tone and then when you try and express it through text, then it's like too much, it's like too many words, and then people don't read it. And they don't internalize what you're trying to say, and actually might even worsen the miscommunication and misunderstanding. That's been my experience, at least. Okay, again, going up there, I think, is where we ultimately want to go. So let's just sort of stick down here for now. Back to the needing to interact stuff thing. It's easier to just say it's bad than say, hey, a DS2 has some cool design choices, but it's really easy if you spam heal gems and most bosses are meh. I mean, yeah, and also it's, I mean, like you said, like the easiness factor. I think if you see a thread that says, I liked Dark Souls 2, rather than saying, you know what? I don't have it in me to go through, like get into the big discussion about it. Like, I just don't, I just don't have it right now. I don't have the energy. And so, yeah, you're just like, this person's just wrong, and I, it, I really need to tell them. <laughs> but I don't have it in me to, like, get into it right now. If it was real life, you'd probably pick your battle and just not engage. It's like you're at Thanksgiving and someone's going off about politics or religion or something, and you're like, I'm not touching that. And you wouldn't, but online... You lose that barrier, and then suddenly you're just, you're in it. And then you say something insulting, or someone says something insulting to you, and, and then you're off. And then the discussion becomes upon, like, well, maybe if you didn't care so much about this thing, you care too much about this thing, how embarrassing, then you wouldn't take it as such a big deal when I say that it sucks. And you're like, it's not about the thing anymore, it's the fact, it's the way you talk to people. At least when, like, when I, I mean, I used to argue with people online a lot. I really enjoyed it, and I still kind of do, but I pick my battles a lot more. And it almost always turns into, look, it's not about the thing. It's about the way you engage with me about the thing. That's pretty much what every fight I get into online becomes, is that's what I try and turn, like, turn it into. I'm like, look, it's not about the thing. You might be an expert about the thing. I might be an expert about the thing, but the way you have chosen to speak to me as a human being is insufferable. The royal you. Nobody here. You're all great. But at a certain point, it's, you know, it's pointless. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's pointless. You're not going to get through to anybody. Once you're at that point of hostility, you're not changing anyone's mind. You're not going to point it out and then be like, oh, you know what? You're right. I'm really sorry. I forgot that you were a real person. That's not going to ha I mean, maybe it will, but most likely not. So, you know. People who only kind of disliked SC2 or moderately hated it wouldn't even bother responding to that. Only people who really hated DS2 would respond to that guy. It skews perceptions of how good it is. True. And that's something, too, with the internet is opinions are very widely shaped by the most extreme because they're the ones who are most likely to respond. To go back 
to my youth my based YouTube dislike button opinion on why that metric holds very little value. It doesn't really tell you much. It it tells you what only the people who are willing to in, to engage think about something. I'm I'm kind of more interested in what people who don't care that much about it think as well. Like, I think that's probably an equally needed metric, and that's probably the majority of people. So it's like, okay, this had a 70% dislike ratio. Is that actually reflective of a popular opinion? Should I even be considering popular opinion when I'm watching a video that's meant to present an argument? Oh yeah, we're above the creepy stairs. In the creepy chair crypt. <laughs> Warfare. Oh boy, here we go. When you start a discussion with people from different cultures that never encountered the mimics and gestures of each other, that you can make discussions more complicated? That's true. I mean, it's, com it's complicated. Language is complicated. That's why it's fun. We're getting into like philo philosophy of words and language and stuff here. This is too much, too deep. We gotta, we gotta shift. Skirt. Gotta pump the brakes. <laughs> One thing I've been discovering more lately too is like. It felt awkward at first, but I try and just be like, I mean, it's gonna sound stupid, but like I try and just be like nice to people, like complimenting people. Or like if I'm gonna engage with someone and I wanna engage them critically, I'll start with like, hey, this was like a really cool, I like, I liked the way you presented this argument or like this was really interesting and then pick one thing about it that you liked, like give them a compliment about it. Then, if you follow up and you want to be like, I disagree with these things and these things and these things for these reasons, and I actually think this is a different interpretation, they're way more likely to engage you back and be like, oh, I didn't think about that way, or oh, you're right, I didn't think about that thing, instead of being like, hey, you don't, you just didn't understand me, but you know, blah, 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 blah. It's just, but in real life as well, I don't know. It's little things. I feel like compliments in a general sense Like, it just makes a big, big difference for people. It's like taking the initiative to be complimentary towards someone, I just feel like is not, it's not that common. It's not as common as I think we would expect it to be. Obviously... <laughs> You don't want to, like... You don't want to be commenting on someone's physical appearance in, like, the workplace. That's probably not a good idea. But... I guess that's just sort of a read-the-room kind of thing. Like, how well do you know someone where you can be like, Hey, that's a cool shirt. You know what I mean? It's like, maybe be careful with that kind of stuff. I don't know. Wait, do I need to go back up? No, I think we just drop back down here. Being able to have a conversation and not make it your life is a learned skill. For sure. For sure. Again, I think some people just kind of find it fun to argue. Um, I have a new bold take, actually. I think that people will put out kind of an edgy take and they're excited for people to engage with it negatively so they can argue about it because deep down they aren't confident about their own opinion. So they're just projecting the insecurity about how unpopular the take is onto other people because they're just, they expect other people to take it negatively and so they're like purposefully sort of will that into existence. 
rather than actually wanting to have a conversation about the thing. But this is me, you know, who just said earlier that I had the hottest take imaginable regarding The Last Jedi. <laughs> so, you know, take that how you will. That's meant for, this is meant for entertainment value, okay? We're entertaining here. I'm not here being like, fight me about it, you know? Though you could, it, it could be fun. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Could be fun. Paying compliments to people triggers people's in-group senses. Insulting people triggers their out-group senses. People respond more positively if they think they're in-group. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier, too, is... I sort of think that most people just sort of inherit a belief system from the people they grew up around, from the people they spend the most time around, from the people that they respect, that they look up to. And, like, you might become an expert on a topic, but I think there's sort of a... There's a bunch of, again, inherited beliefs. Ooh, we almost got both without having to deal with these motherfuckers. There we go. So, like, I feel like depending on where you grew up and where you currently live, probably your... Maybe less so your gender, but definitely your age... And, like, your social class and how you grew up. I feel like with that information, you could probably predict 90% plus of someone's core belief system. If you could tell me what your best friend's belief system was, then I could guarantee I could guess yours. Not even your closest friend, but, like, if you gave me one sort of tangential, like... Like, if you told me you had a really good friend and they really loved... Oh, gosh, now I'm, I don't want to get controversial. <laughs> I don't want to get too controversial. But basically, if you gave me some tangential beliefs, like something that's not super important, but like something telling, just one thing about each of your friends, I could probably guess what most of your beliefs in life are. And I'm not saying, like, I'm big brain. I just think, like, you could probably make a computer program you just plug these things into, and it's just sort of an if-then statement. And I think, again, really what it comes down to is what that in-group, out-group is, and the whole, like, validation thing is you can meme on it all you want, but I think that's kind of what drives... Like, let's, like, like, drive society. We live in a society. That's what drives human interaction and the desire to be a social species. Like, there has to be some level of congruency in the group. Um, this elevator, I think, takes us legit where we want to go. So let's go up. Actually, I don't remember. Let's take this elevator. I think this is this leads us to um, Blythe, or not? Not it's not Blythe, but it's it's the Baleful Shadow. Just takes his form. Medium takes on media are the most extreme takes of 2024. I agree. <laughs> I 100% agree. Okay, let's hit this. Yeah, this I think is where we. This is how we get to. Um, Lake of Rot, eventually. So we'll come back. I have to go back to the start of Noxdell and go up the staircase instead. Formic rocks, are they ant shit? They're ant- they're related to ants. They're made- it's made by ants. It's like a byproduct of ants. But I don't know if it's their poop or shit. I don't know. But it's definitely ant related. My best friend is a fascist. I'm a socialist. People are more complicated than that. Okay. <laughs> Number one, weird. <laughs> Number two, if this is actually true to such an extreme as you've labeled yourself and your friend, I suspect those are probably hyperbolized labels. But uh, that being said, um, that certainly seems to be the exception. But that's kind of why there's so much polarization is because we have two groups in the country that are becoming incredibly homogenized. Hence, hyperpolarization. Instead of sort of having a, a smattering of like, you kind of have a general divide, 
but it's sort of a smattering of stuff. Instead, now you just have two solid things very far apart. Whereas before, maybe you could draw a bit of a spider web between some of the people. Now, I mean, you could even look at, I mean, the U.S. Congress, you can look at, like, polarization or, like, voting patterns over the past 30, 40 years. It's quite fascinating. Let those blow up and destroy each other. The highest... I didn't know that has the highest natural hardness in the game. And I didn't mean to insult your... your... political labels. I just... I think the meme in general is that these terms are highly overused in today's day and age. But I guess if they're self-assigned, then... you know... You all do you. I ag oh, do. I completely agree. Yes, it's uh, it was Newt Gingrich policies in the '90s. Absolutely. But again, with the internet, I think came this. Um, I think came this. Um, this hyperpolarization that happened easily because, again, if you grew up in a community that sort of requires some level of ag agreeableness. To have some sort of congruency to say, like, okay, we have Democrats and Republicans, and we might have some people who are a bit on the fringes. But in order to sort of participate here, you have to, we have to agree, like, we need, we need traffic lights, we need sewage processing, we need clean water, we need electricity, right? And now, <laughs> while we still have those things, it's almost in spite of the polarization that is happening. And there, it's very hard to find agreement on a lot of this stuff. On the most simple of things. And it becomes less about what is true or, like, could be evidence-based practice, and much more so what hurts my opponent the most. What about the finger plate shield? I don't know, I just feel like in the last few years I've just gotten really blackpilled about how people believe what they believe and sort of examining myself and how I believe what I believe, just because I'm, it's not like I'm certainly, it's, I'm certainly not an exception, but I just, after watching so many people so heavily shift their beliefs in the last six to ten years, I mean, I know that's a long period of time, I'm just saying, I'm not saying it took that long for every person, I just mean in the last six to ten years, you've seen people go through these shifts in, these extreme shifts in ideology, and you see a lot of that seems to be so that they can follow trends of their in-group. As opposed to... Something that they've sort of formulated themselves. Because if they formulated an opinion themselves from, like, a core belief... Say about... I, you know what? Let's not. I won't even. But you can fill in the blank yourself. And then suddenly, their opinion shifts and it becomes a mainstream opinion of an entire party or the fringe of an entire party and it becomes a much different, differently held belief from a lot of different people. That's one of those things where, it, to me, it, it sort of comes across as like, it's not that suddenly these people have access to some new type of evidence that changed their minds. It's that they've now inherited that belief from the larger group.
But that's what I mean. Like, as you grow up, you're going to have the same beliefs as your parents. And it's it, unless you spend a lot of time with someone else and you have no access to any other opinions, like, of course, your opinion is going to be exactly the same as the people you spend the most time with. Of course. Like, you don't have, it's not like you have access to something else. But then maybe you, you do start having access to different information and then maybe that'll start changing. I don't... I remember that that room just has a ton of silver tears that drop from the ceiling. I feel like this is... this is Tonight has been one of my spiciest rants. It's a little too serious. I feel like it's a little too aggressive. All the other ones kind of came with a tinge of... Of irony or meme... Memeness. And they were also very easy to agree with. <laughs> don't do it. Son of a... No! No! Oh my gosh. Bro. You need to play the sax and lighten the mood? That's right. I'm gonna think I'm gonna finish Noxtella and then yeah. I do yeah, I'm gonna practice before it gets too late. Ghost glove wart? Spooky. Since times of old, large glove warts were used to comfort heroic spirits. Given in tribute to those who died the most glorious of deaths in the hope their stories would become legend. A spirit nestles close to this grand specimen. Those are generally found under the chair crypts. This one, I'm less sure, but... Gonna have me on in the background? Cool. I really like risky, spicy Jay Barino. See what I was saying earlier where I... I <clears throat> yeah, I, I am a little afraid to be a little too... A little too confrontational. Because part of me is like, what's the point? I'm old for, for YouTube. I'm not old, but I'm old for by YouTube standards, okay? This is where there's a billion that dropped from the ceiling, I think. So many. Oh, there's so many. Jay will be 90 on YouTube, still talking about the glorious days of StarCraft. If I'm still doing this when I'm 90, just fucking kill me. <laughs> like. Jeez. Jeez. Don't do it. All this for what? For what? Are these ants not actually ants since they have skulls? Or is it just the ant exoskeleton called a skull due to mammals and insects not being categorized as different? Bro, I actually have no idea. I have not put enough thought into that. That's where we want to go. Let's back up just a little bit. Fingerprint shield is guard boost instead of heart. Sorry, sometimes I read the, the messages in a weird order. I apologize. Sometimes you'll hear me respond to your message like way later than when you sent it. But I usually get there. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Golden centipede. Where's the twinkler? I, I hear a twinkler, and I can't just let it be. Was it above me? No. There it is. Don't. Don't. Delightful. I guess we should have done this before Dragon Barrow based on the upgrade materials we're getting. Do you enjoy streaming more than playing by yourself? Is chat present something you enjoy or don't really care much of? Um, it depends, but usually I prefer streaming because like, you're all cool. Sometimes, you know, it's these are low viewer streams, so like... If you have a 10 viewer stream and there's one person talking and they're obnoxious, then it's not fun. But like, that's, you know, that's rare though. Like, you all here, a lot of you I've seen more than once. A lot of you I've seen a lot more than once. And like, I know that it's cool. So like, I much prefer this. Also, um, a big part too is... Oh my gosh. A big part, too, is the game. And also, like, chat... Like, I just say chat, but, like, you all who are here, especially the people that I know pretty well, like, you are really good at giving me prompts that I can go off on, and, like, it fuels the banter engine. When I'm playing alone, I really struggle to prompt myself with fun and interesting banter topics. I need to improve on that. I mean, it's been ten years. I feel like, unless I make a specific effort to get better at it, I'm just not going to. I would have by now if... <laughs> If it was just something that would have happened. So I need to, I just like, maybe I need to like write topics down. But like, I feel like my YouTube videos could be, or and could have been all this time so much better if I had some prompted topics to just riff about. Because so much of it is just like, it's reliant on people who just enjoy the games. But to build a presence that goes beyond what, um, you know, just the enjoyment of the games and like, oh, it's a popular game. Or like, oh, you, you know, Warcraft 3 has a, a you know, a viewer base, like, the way that you build a better fan base and a more fun fan base is, like, you interact with them on levels that go beyond the game. Which, you can do streaming. <clears throat> like, you like you prompted me with this question, for example. It's good shit. Okay, I think this just takes us back down to the bottom, and then we can go to the grace that we opened up later. Um, whereas, yeah, for YouTube, I think it's like I get so tunnel-visioned on what I'm playing, and a big part of that is, like, that's part of the reason I like recording by myself, is look, I, I know that this is gonna sound kind of hippy-dippy TikTok bullshit, but, like, I do have ADHD for real, and recording videos helps me sort of chill my mind because it allows me to focus on one thing, and... That's helped me a lot, but at the same time, I'm focused on the game to the point where I'm just like, okay, let's beat the game. And it's less about like, oh, let's talk about flossing. And actually, the one series I think I did really good with banter was StarCraft Remastered. And the reason was, is I knew the game so well, and it was so easy for me at that time, because I had so much experience with it, that I was able to very purposefully take the time to think about some wacky banter. And prompt myself with it. But I could be playing anything, I mean, and then just, and then just go on wacky banter if someone else prompts me with it. Which is what you all... <laughs> are able to do and then we have like a and the other thing too is like we have a real-time conversation about it it's not just me talking i mean a lot of it is just me talking into the void let's let's not get it twisted but you know you all can respond based on those answers from what you have you know what you were expecting 
Okay, I think this is it. And then that's the elevator that takes us down here. Yep, okay, good. Streaming's a middle ground between playing by yourself or playing with a friend? Yeah, that's probably, that's probably so. I mean, like, I have friends I'll play games with that we don't record. Or maybe, like, I'll record them, but I don't ever upload them. Like, I maybe have the intention to upload them, and then I never do. The Dark Templar will respond. I turned my life remained one. Though he was created, he was a colossal failure. Lies and Egypt. Yet, they both I must betray. Ah, another one. Ah, I've let's forget what thou. Ah, I've let's forget what Isn't it, you kill, it's, Estelle is at the end of Lake of Rot, right? You have to go through Lake of Rot first. Sucks. Noxtella is a cool area that we just went through. I like that. I think Nokron is a little more interesting, especially because Ancestor Spirit is close by, and then it has a real boss like the Gargoyles. There's not really a Noxtella boss. If you look long enough to, to the Dark Abyss, you'll slip in slowly into madness. That's my... I have the real Nietzsche quote. It, that's my... It's on my, like, main channel. Like the little tagline under the Jay Barino Plays banner. I've grown to really like that quote and appreciate it more and more, because I find that to be an argument against nihilism rather than... Like it's a warning, it's a warning to not be nihilistic as opposed to sort of the general acceptance of it. Okay, this is Blythe. Yeah, well, it's not Blythe. It's the Baleful Shadow. Whatever, he's going to die. Maybe. Oh Shadow, thou art the last. Tell the two fingers that Rani the Witch come. Rend thy flesh with a fateful wound, ne'er to heal. How do you like stuff like the co-op recordings with Grant and Synergy? Did it ever feel like creating content versus chill chat? I mean, it's both. That's why I really like it. Um... I mean, when you record with someone like Grant, what's nice about it is... Oh, she got me with the... Uh, I didn't realize he had, um, like, a destined death thing on his sword. Um, like, you're both kind of aware that, like, you gotta make it entertaining. Because, <laughs> like, you both do it for so much time. Like, you understand what you need to do to sort of make something kind of silly and fun. So... I think, like, playing with Char and playing with Grant and playing with Deltrin back in the day and Subsorian, like, that's always really fun. Just because having someone to bounce things off of is just a blast. And, like, Grant, for example, like, Grant is a professional. Like, he knows how to make something entertaining no matter what's happening on the screen. <laughs> that's, like, his, it's his job. He's really good at it. So it's, it's very easy to make content through just chilling with someone who's who you're friends with. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that playthrough with Grant and Synergy was possibly my most popular series ever. More, may, probably more than Arthas campaign. That says a lot. Beautifully fought. My thanks. It was more of a challenge than I envisioned. Now I can finally stand before them. This is farewell, my dear. Tell Bly and Eiji 
I love her. Okay, now we can get the ring. Okay, let's put something on that increases our defense against Scarlet Rot. I don't have a plus one here, but that's I'll use this one, that's fine. And then let's also... Grab these and maybe make a few more. And then just be ready to use Flame Cleanse Me a lot. Co-op playthrough between Witty and Azathen. That was not Witty. That was Deltrin Live. Old friend of the channel, Deltrin Live. But yeah, Azathen too. Dude, Azathen apparently was involved in... He was he was dating, like, a much larger YouTuber. And he was involved in some insane drama shit, apparently. It was wild, because, like, I knew... I, at a There was a point in time, I felt like I knew Azathen pretty well. Spent a lot of time playing games with him, and I really liked his um, Azeroth Wars cast, but apparently he just had been in some serious drama with other people. And, um... Not just that, but, like, lit now recently, I want to say, like, within the last year, maybe, there was some, incra there was some, like, crazy stuff that he was involved in. I think he, like, he came out looking good. I mean, that doesn't sound right. I think he was, like, legitimately being, like, straight up emotionally abused. I don't know the details. By his larger YouTuber girlfriend. It was like a huge thing for a lot of drama channels. I never really checked the details, but it seemed seemed like a big thing. Oh, the Azathen and Witty one they did on their own. Oh, I thought you said that the three of us did something. I gotcha. Not everything can be about you. I understand. You got me. No! No, not again. Get out of there. Oh, these things dropped Aeonian Butterflies. Interesting. Well, that seems good. The Lake of Rot, one of the most foundational ideas in Dark Souls, made into an actual location here in Elden Ring. Okay, we haven't really gone very far, so maybe let's kind of cover this area and then head back.
Come on. There we go. I didn't know that those dropped, though. So you can farm more and more. You can farm. Okay. Yeah. I guess I've never struggled with getting enough, but still. Well, that's something I could use. Sometimes evolution is just unfair. True. Can I just... Let's go hit this button and then we... Well... Let's just go back here. This is fine. Yeah, something's one of those people that probably was okay with just being a smallish type channel who just got direct the dirt. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's always the small channels that go through the craziest fucking shit, it seems like. It's just some of the weird... Like, I got involved in some stupid drama years back. I mean, I would consider myself a very small creator, and then the person who... I was having drama with was a much even like a su substantially smaller channel than me. It's always that kind of shit. <laughs> it's always, always, always just stupid bullshit like that. Okay, we're gonna make another foray kind of out into the abyss, out in this direction. And just use our flasks. And our FP. What was it? Well, um, it was mostly around kind of that conversation earlier. Like, a lot of it was miscommunication. Um, but we just, there were just, a, there was a community member who had some folks that they appealed to. Um, that I spent some time with, and they were they were pretty charming, and like I got along with them decently. But then eventually they started being pretty combative with folks on my Discord server, um, and it just wasn't. It was like just too much. Like it was too intense, and um, yeah, it just sort of reached a boiling point. And rather than just addressing it head on like I should have, and just been like, "Hey, you're not really fitting in here," much earlier. It just sort of boiled over. And then it became like a multi-year thing as they would take like screenshots on my Discord and share it around and talk shit. And then people on my Discord would send me screenshots from their Discord and I would tell them to stop doing that. But they kept doing it. And yeah, it was just, it was just very silly overall. Um, I mean, that's easy to say now. But again, it was one of those things where like, just didn't have the proper communicative experience to figure shit out and just, like, nip it in the bud. But it's also something I feel like a lot of online forum administrators go through at some point in their life. Not their life. They're in their experience. What happens is you open up a forum and you say... And you say... Not this place. Mm-mm. We don't need rules here. The only rule we need, we only need one rule, and it's to don't be an asshole. Every forum does this. So many forums do this. That's all we need. Just don't be an asshole. That covers it. Uh-uh. You don't think you need a rule at work that says don't microwave fish for lunch. Until you do. Until you need it. Okay? This is something that every forum goes through. You don't think you could possibly need to have to specify something so ridiculous. And then you do. And then you do. And you think, how could I have been so stupid to think that people wouldn't do this? <laughs> when of course they would. Anyway. It's a new age. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's cool. I mean... I don't know what's really going on these days in that realm of things, but basically, like, the the issue about it all was, like, it lingered for, like, months and years, honestly. Um, and it wasn't even the person in question. It was their community. I mean, they kind of egged them on, I think. But, like, yeah, it was just kind of an insufferable <laughs> period of time where it felt like 
I mean, imagine you just like you just sort of have an anti-fan community. That's pretty much how it functioned. I mean, it wasn't just about me, but like it was it was kind of an anti-fan community. <clears throat> and that's uh, that's difficult to deal with when you don't really have experience in um, how to deal with this kind of stuff. So yeah, you make rules and you think we don't need rules. We don't need too many rules. We just, you know, we just tell people like, don't be an asshole. We're going to enforce this. And then people will push the boundaries, push, push, push. They won't really, um, they won't really read the room. And like, you can't really blame some people because sometimes some people just don't have the. I, I, now it sounds like I'm being passive aggressive, but genuinely some people just don't have the ability to read the room. It's not that simple, so I'm not trying to say it should be that simple, but for some people it's not simple. That's really that. And uh, I'm not trying to be mean when I say that. Um, and then, yeah, it just became like more and more of an issue as time went on <laughs> as like a proxy passive-aggressive war between Discord, like small Discord servers, which is why it's embarrassing in retrospect. But, you know, honestly, at this point, um... I mean, I guess it's weird to say, like, I wish these other people the best. Really, all I could say is I just wish that they uh, never think or speak of me. <laughs> That's because I don't really anymore. I mean, you asked me about it. Um, but yeah, it, it felt bad. I had a mod who was taking screenshots from the mod chat and would share them on this other server. Like, that was a really big breach of trust that hurt me. That really hurt me. Um, that, that felt really bad uh, at the time. And then I responded to that person very poorly, publicly. And uh, this was maybe, I don't know, six years ago? Probably more at this point. Probably more. So yeah, in general, it just wasn't, it wasn't good. <laughs> a lot of mess ups across the board. <laughs> but hey, it's all a learning experience. Um, all I can say is... Um, People push boundaries. It might not even necessarily be malicious, but if you think that people will ever sort of implicitly get the hint that they need to chill, um, and it's been more than a couple days or a couple warnings or whatever, a couple conversations, they're not. It's not going to stop. You have to be more firm about it. Like a big part of it for me was like I was just too passive with it all. And then that's what let it sort of get worse and worse and worse. And then I got more and more frustrated. And that's what caused me to make really bad decisions. So again, big learning experience, frankly. And not something that I feel like most people in general have to go through. Unless maybe you're like a manager and you have some particularly difficult employees. <laughs> Where you have to like constantly be doing... Um, Like, conflict resolution and, and, uh, remediating, or, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but basically just, like, being, a an interpreter of... between two parties. Let's pull this thing back a little bit. Okay, that's better. But like, even talking about it now, it's been years, and I still feel awkward talking about it, because I'm like, oh no, someone's going to clip this, and it's going to get shared. Again, that's like, it, that shouldn't happen. It's been so long, I can't imagine I am disgusted or thought about it in any capacity. But I, I imagine it would be kind of a similar situation. If I'm brought up, then it becomes a thing, <laughs> you know? And I... I've been, I've learned to try to avoid that at all costs after what I went through. Um, just felt kind of like, really, just some of the stuff that I've seen said about me and people that I consider friends was really beyond the pale. Like, I would never, like, I'll say some passive-aggressive shit about people, but some of the, some of the stuff said about me was, again, this was years ago, but it was really mean. It was very personal for no reason. And it was really, really mean. <laughs> and then they, there's kind of an audacity of, like, how dare you ban people from the Discord? And I'm like, have you seen 
what some of these people are saying? Like, no, of course they're banned. <laughs> but hey. Um, I buried the hatchet with a few folks that I had some particular problems with, and then, you know, been good since then, so. I'm once again gonna refresh my FP. I'm at a million again? Hell yeah. We didn't make it to two. Did we make it to two? I think we made it to two, so that means we have to go even further this time. Though, at, at, now that we're at Mountaintop, I, I'm a little concerned. I don't think we're actually going to keep our souls. Alright, see you, Hayato. Oh shit, yeah. I do have to... We gotta do some practicing here. It's 9.15. I, got, I feel like I need to... I should not play past 10. That would be the polite thing to do. I guess I could just use staunching boluses. I have to admit to you, I once microwaved fish, but it was when we were living in my parents' house. Look, again, it's not at the workplace. Yeah, that's fine. Do it at home. But, like, if you're doing it somewhere where the smell will just sort of linger and people are stuck there, <laughs> that's where that's, that's the problem. <laughs> I'm not here to tell people to not eat microwave fish. Look, sometimes you got leftovers, you know? That's just how it be. Sometimes they legit do not know the, the smell will spread. And linger. That's what I mean, though. And that's why... That's what I'm talking about in terms of, like, the assumptions we make. Is you think you don't need to post. Hey, don't microwave fish. That seems like a really specific thing that you wouldn't have to make a rule for. And then you realize, like, oh, some people actually don't know. It's... I mean, it's kind of a judgment against those people. But, like, whether you like it or not, or whether you want to throw shade at them or not, they exist. <laughs> The whole point is just acknowledge, like, yep, yeah, this, this exists as, like, a type of person. It's okay. I mean, maybe it's not okay, but, like, it's a fact of life. It's like people that go slow in the fast lane, okay? We've talked about that same topic. But it was the same thing, like, that's the thing with, like, form administration. You think, like, there's surely I don't need overly specific rules. And then what happens is you have the don't be an asshole rule. Everybody starts with the don't be an asshole rule. They think they're so chill. They think they're so cool. My community's great. We don't need these rules. Until you do. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Believe you me. And that's the problem, too. If you start with too many rules, then you get accused of being, like, overly... I mean, I guess for lack of a better term, overly litigious. Like, too overbearing with your rules. And, like, your mods are too aggressive as well. Like, stuff like that. And, um... It's a hard line to tread. Because a lot of it is like, oh, I didn't think I needed this rule. But the problem is, again, people... There are some people who... Most are not malicious, but they just... It's like they know. It, it, you can't help but feel like it's malicious. I think I... I'm at the point in my life where I choose to decide it's not malicious. They just don't know better and they'll just push the boundaries just perfectly enough to feel like it must be malicious like you think surely they know the impact they're having surely they know and understand that this is not jiving with the environment and again believe you me the answer is they don't and you just got to come to terms with that um, so, like, my my Discord has gone through periods where it's had an absurd amount of rules, and then I scale it back, and then there's, like, one problem user, and then you have to expand the rules again. And at a certain point, it sort of does just become, like, don't be an asshole. You're like, look, just don't annoy me. If you annoy me, you're getting banned. I don't need to justify it. I don't care if you go and cry somewhere else that I have inconsistent rules. Um, you know, I've been through this enough. Thank you. 
So it's it's an interesting semi horseshoe that happens. Yeah, let's get to... I'm just going to get to the grace inside of this place. There's one more button to push to. I think that's it down there. Oh, I need... Well, I actually need to push it before. And I'm out of... We can do some boluses. Let's use these. And there's more to explore in the swamp down there, too. Or the, the lake. Casual this guy down here. I see rules as just guidelines on how not to be an asshole. And that's why... I think that's why it can be challenging for folks is because they think, like, surely people don't need these guidelines. Because I wouldn't need these guidelines. You think to yourself, I wouldn't need these guidelines. Um, but, you know, I think we all maybe overestimate ourselves. You, maybe you'd end up on a server where you're just not, jiv it just, you're just not jiving. And then, <laughs> sure enough... I still have a rule. I mean, I've condensed my rule set quite a bit, but I still have the one. I haven't needed to enforce it pretty much for years and years, but I still have one. I said no cross-server screenshots for purposing purposes of gossip or drama. So it's kind of like if I get sent a screenshot in private from another server of someone who is doing that, then I would ban them from my server. I haven't had to do that for a long time, but there was a period where I did. Um... Yeah, you know what? Let's head back here and let's do some let's do some saxophone. Man, you got you got me you got me reminiscing about the olden days. Holy shit. Again, this was a long time ago, but as you can tell, uh it did leave a bit of a mark on me. Again, a lot of it really came down to similar to what we were talking about before, like feeling so misunderstood, like purposefully so. People who don't like you and they'll purposefully take you out of context and just give you the the least charitable interpretation of everything you say. It, uh, it doesn't feel good when you know that there are people out there who are determined to do that specifically. Um, sucks. And again, it was uh, kind, of, like, kind of a big betrayal of trust to have a, a mod who had access to a chat where, you know, I said things that weren't meant to be shared, but even still they were shared out of context, and then they were interpreted worsely out of context, and yeah, just uh, really, really felt poor at the time. But, you know, again, big learning experience. I think uh, we haven't gone through anything like that really ever since. Everything's coming up Millhouse. Hell yeah. I guess we'll let our character sit here and rest at Lake of Rot. It doesn't feel right. But I guess we'll just chill and overlook the Lake of Rot. Okay. I still need those rules very rarely. If I get into an argument, I might say some truly horrendous shit. I'm with you. That's what I'm saying. That's why I said earlier. Like, I don't want to pretend like I'm somehow, like, galaxy brain above the concept of, like, rule breaking or being an asshole to somebody. Because, like, yeah, I'll get super into it. 2021 Jay Bruno was super combative on a lot of Discord servers. I had a blast. But then sometimes you need like a you need a mod or some like a power user who's there a lot to remind you like, hey, can we just like chill out? And you're like, oh, you're right.
I think I'm going to be working on the same thing tonight. I apologize in advance if that's a little boring, but um, I want to try and use the backtrack and um, actually record myself playing. Um, like, you'll hear the backtrack, but I'll be recording it without the backtrack so that I can actually record a potentially usable solo that I can then... Because then I, I can record the rest of the melody around it, it's like, if I can record a solo and then the melody separately, then I can put them together into one thing and send them to my instructor and they'll get put on the thing, so. Yeah, and your roommate brought you a Big Mac? That's, that's, the, that's the good shit. Let's do Circle of Fifths. Let's see how fast we can do it. Oh, hang on, my wife is texting me. She's out of town this weekend. But I got a lot of shit to do this weekend. Such as streaming Elden Ring, attending my saxophone lesson, uh, attending a virtual baby shower for some close friends of ours, and um, I think that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. You live in a town without a McDonald's. Yeah, that actually does sound like a legit, uh, that does, that sounds legit, you know? Oh, yes, and I will be playing Dawn of War 2, colon, Retribution, with my good friend from across the sea, Shardundred, on Sunday. Okay, let me pull up the backtrack. Let me pull up, oh gosh, no, 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 I don't want to be tabbed into that. See, I, I don't know, I don't know what that, is that a song? I'm just making this shit up. Um, what did I want to do? I want to open the program... What is it called? Audacity. It's called Audacity. That's what it is. Oh, ho, ho, ho. okay. Let's get this shit running. Is this only recording my microphone? Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Oh, baby. And then maybe we move the microphone down a little bit. I'll be quieter, but hopefully it's better for the instrument. Try and do it three times so that I can try and reinforce the correct, the correct one. I've been starting to use you love to hear it in my everyday vocabulary by accident. I blame you for this. I'm sorry. Kind of like everything's coming up Millhouse. Doing the Lord's work. Wake up, honey. Blank just dropped. Shared space. Jazz play-alongs. Georgia on my mind. Let me pull up the sheet music. Here is the sheet music. Okay, I have it. It's available on another screen. And then we open up the backtrack. One, two, three, four. I'm going to put on my headphones so that I can hear the backtrack because when I'm playing the instrument, it's way too quiet. Also, I'm not sure if my uh, voice is really quiet now because my microphone is far away from my face. Am I from North America? Absolutely. 
East Coast, Best Coast, baby. All right, let me move this down a little bit further. this let's start the audacity recording one two three four the buttons a lot i don't know how else to do it like how else am i supposed to record myself so that i don't hear the you know like is there a way i think that's just the way it is okay tuner Scrib, scrib, scribble D. Um, jazz material, that's what I'm talking about. This is what we. Oh my god, that's so loud. Okay. <laughs> okay, close this. So it's that A. So. It That's actually like perfectly in tune. I still got it. Okay, we came up with that little riff yesterday, and it's still there. We're still we, we're still cooking with gas. All right. Okay. Everything's great. Blow that trombone! How dare you, Fred? Okay, let's actually. I was gonna do the circle of fifths, and I was gonna time myself. It's just I got stuck on B. I got stuck on B major, and, you know, it's not a great one to get stuck on. It's still, you know, it's not even halfway around the circle. So let's try again. I got 41 seconds yesterday. We want to keep it under a minute, even with mistakes. If I make a mistake, I have to redo it. <laughs> Forty-three seconds. It's 
Let's try it one more time. <laughs> I slow down around the F sharp, D flat, A flat. That's expected. It's the opposite side of the circle. It's the highest number of sharps and flats. Flat's getting me. That A flat's getting to me. You really know how to play clarinet? <laughs> how dare you? That's okay. Clarinets can be cool too. Not all of them, but some of them can be cool. One of my best friends plays clarinet or played clarinet. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is just play through the song, through around the, uh, up until about the solo. That way I can have a version of it that I can then use to sort of stitch together later. So let's, let's do that. One, two, three. Four. Not that one. One, two, three, four. That's just like that's the that's the normal song. That's just the normal song.
it's really that A. Like, I can't decide if I need to do something with it. It's just... Does it need to be louder? Do I need to give it, like, more oomph? Just, like... Myself. That's so that's the solo I have planned. hits just right. I'm keeping that no matter what. I think I lean a little too hard into the vibrato too. I'm trying to hit notes without it and then bring it in later. So we do like a little... For the second verse, we do like the... Yeah, and then we use that to close it out. Okay. I'm going to do the, just the normal melody one more time. I know it might be a little repetitive, but... But... I want to get a good take. I'm going to export this one and save it just in case, though. Pretty much every time I do a full one, I just want to... <laughs> it defaulted to a folder called Arcane Predictions. <laughs> okay. Just local recording is fine, please. Georgia on my... Mind. Melody one. I also have to take my dog out to pee soon. She's been she's been waiting and my wife's out of town. My wife normally does night walk. Export? Is it just that easy? Is it? Is it like my ADHD brain where I hear like a long held note and it's like not good enough because there's not enough happening, but like it sounds okay? Does it sound okay? I think it sounds fine. I think it's in tune for the most part, but I'm here over here like when I hear that like dun dun, that A as it just sits there for three beats, I'm like, ah, we gotta, it's gotta be doing something. It's not, it's not enough. Also, let me move the microphone back down here like this. There's a Okay, let's just run through the whole, let's just run through the melody. Uno mas. Well, not necessarily one more time. It might be multiple. We'll see. Record, and then we do this. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Starting over. I don't like it. 
like it. I didn't like it. I'm like too, uh, like, I know like you Why? don't have to necessarily be on the beat, but for the first run through the melody, we should probably stick a little closer without the like, you know, random offbeat. Also, I realized for you all, it might sound like it doesn't line up exactly with the backtrack because there might be the slightest latency between the background track that you're hearing and then my microphone picking up my instrument. So, you know, that's the way it is though. So, <laughs> good luck. One, two, three, four. <laughs> which is a lot of this song. Just a tad smidge, pull that out a little bit. Still sharp. How about this? How about this? to be the sharpest note on the instrument so I have to really compensate okay let's do this again record one, two, three, four.
saw psychedelics say just relax, and I took that to heart. No, no, I don't worry. I wouldn't. It's no different on stream than if I was doing it in it without stream. I would do the same number of unhinged redos and retakes. Um, that's just how I, that's just how it rolls. Honestly, doing it on stream is what motivates me to keep going. So that's helpful. Um, okay, I'm gonna do I'm gonna export this one, and then I'm gonna do one more, and then I'm gonna take Coco outside for a walk, and then we're gonna come out and continue. Yeah, Lake of Rot, that's right. Okay. Let's go one more time. The Ds tend to be really sharp, too. Which is tough, because that's where you end. run out of breath that's a tough spot to run out of breath okay here we go one more one two three four <laughs> sometimes, it sometimes it just doesn't feel right sometimes it just doesn't feel right one two three four That's a spot. Of all the spots to breathe, that is one of them. Okay. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
I'm thinking a lot on where I need to breathe because I'm running out of breath for some of the longer notes. It's all right. All right. Hey, Brett. Record playback track. One, Here we go. Two, three, four. <laughs> breathing when I need to to hit that maybe I just breathe at the quarter note breathe yeah I think that's probably it one two three four should be an American Idol. <laughs> oh, stupid audacity. Audacity work! There we go.
It's those end notes where I'm like losing, I'm losing my breath. Losing my breath a little bit on them. That one was pretty good. I'm going to do one more and then we can do some solo stuff. He said after saying the last time would be the last time. Thanks, Warfare. That's nice of you. But see, now you're now you're you're here for the iterative process as we bang it out, you know? Solo stuff, I've got a few, you know, we do like a pretty straightforward i almost feel like for the solo i have it almost completely worked out i just don't feel super confident about the one like really how to start because i i kind of like the idea of starting with like a and then i'm like how do i want to transition a bit much that's a little extra are you worse versed in music theory feels like you have a good sense um not i mean yes and no nothing too advanced but like kind of <laughs> a little bit it just feels like it fits well but i'm it's like how do i link it to the next piece, which is the... Because that's the B minor, and it fits really well, and it leads really well into the G minor. So, like, I like it. And then you could either follow up with, like... Or you can do, like, a... Either way, you're hitting the... You're hitting the the C sharp, C natural. I like that for the end of the first repeat. That's all fine. It's just, it's connecting really the first two measures to the third where I'm getting kind of hung up. I could simplify it a little bit too. Instead of doing like the... then it's like, how do you link that? I could just do like a... Because that just feels nice. And that le that's like, that puts you right into the second measure. And instead of going down to the D, what if I go up to the D? Like, I love in the second measure the C-sharp, B-flat. That resolves really nicely, so it feels weird to go into, like, a bluesy... So maybe I could disconnect these things. And we do the second... So the through the first repeat... We do, we keep it simple and we do like a. <laughs> that 
that's maybe where we bring in the E. Or we can do like a... I have this written down how I want this one to be. I have it written down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a weird riff in there at the end that I could do, but I don't think I need it. You watch a 20 minute video that made you feel like a music. Hell yeah, dude. Sometimes that's what it takes, you know? I actually think my second take of the melody was great. So I think I'll just keep that. And then again, it's like figure it like the solo. It's just like doing it over and over until Cause like I think I have a general idea through the first repeat. Let's let's work on it. Let's let's workshop it a little bit. So we're at two minutes. just fine it's simple and we just end on the d and then when on the d then we can kind of go back up and then do like a okay yes i think this can work I was on the wrong math measure. I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Okay. wasn't executed perfectly but that was like the structure right there was like fine perfect so i'm just gonna work on that i guess so i think for the first yeah the first go around we just do a simple and then we can do like a kind of you know juice it up a little bit but then second measure we do the and then you move into the second go around then I could consider doing like a though honestly that doesn't really fit the same style it doesn't feel like it's the same style so maybe maybe not like I as much as I like the idea of that do 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 it's just not it's a little too upbeat for the kind of the chill vibe that I have up until this point so instead maybe we just do a just a a jazzier version of the main melody, which is, you know. And then we get our little riff. And 
then we come back in with the coda. <laughs> you know, just change the genre up completely. It's that easy. I feel I feel better about this. I feel pretty good about this. I'd like to spice up the first measure if I could. Instead of just bum bum, but if I keep it that then that's okay. And then I could even if I I would love to extend the solo a little bit. What is the instrument? It's an alto saxophone. If I could extend the solo a little bit into instead of the Maybe we do like a little something like down and I like don't want to lose it I like it I like it so much but it just doesn't fit with the vibe you know <laughs> Coco's about to pee in my chair. I took her out later today in the afternoon. It's okay. She's fine. Coco has gone really long without peeing in the past. I don't know how she does it, but she has like a bladder of steel. If she if she needed to go, she would come and get me. <laughs> I'm busy! Actually, this is about, I mean, I think I'll stop for today just because it's a little late and I don't want to disturb the people who live close to me. But that was fun. I think I got a, a decent... I got a decent melody recorded, and I think I have the solo, like, fully figured out how what I want to do with it, like, measure to measure. That being said, as I said earlier in the stream, I don't love the idea of, like, constructing a solo this way. And I want to get to the point where I can actually, you know improvise the whole thing like i could improvise but the fact that i'm recording it for like a little it's not even it's a, you know it's not like a real it's just a, it's a goofy little album my studio that i attend is is putting it together it's nice but the fact that it's recorded makes me think like i should get this just right you know so that's why i'm interested in doing that Okay, I am going to go take the dog out. It'll only take five minutes. And then I will come back and let's get to Estelle. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone, who's who's joined today. I have, I, I have a nice time. I mean, what... Doing it on stream is weird because what it does is it motivates me to keep going. <laughs> like, if I get home from work and I'm like, well, you know, I've got maybe 20, 25 minutes to practice a little bit before it's time to make dinner. 
Um, whereas now, like, not only are we playing Elden Ring, which I want to do, when I hit a point in the game where I'm like, I hate this place, we can play some saxophone. <laughs> so we'll get this one nailed down, and then it'll be on to the next one, which is going to be take five. And I haven't even considered the solo for that one. And honestly, that's one where we just, you know, we just read the transcription of the of the original one because it's, um, you know, Paul Desmond's original solo is quintessential so we just take that one and then we <laughs> maybe we modify that a little bit but that will be ours okay i'll be back and then um we'll play some more of this game let me turn the music back on for you i guess no it's not really music is it it's ambient sounds There you go.
All right, for your patient, for you patient folks who have waited, let's see if I'm gonna see if I can show you all Coco's greenie dance. Coco, you want to show them? That was a pretty low energy one today, Coco. You could have put on a better show. Oh, now she's dancing for it in the hallway. That wasn't the best of the Coco dances. I'll, uh, sometimes they get a little crazy. That could have been better, Coco. Okay. Sometimes she goes crazy for it. Not today, I guess. Bitch. All right, what are we doing? Estelle? This community is starved for Coco content. We'll t literally take any sc uh, scrap. Let me tell you, being the owner of Coco, we also are starved for Coco affection. She is, She's a very cat-like dog. She's very... Very non-affectionate. <laughs> she's very aloof. She she's she doesn't like her coat being touched too much. Like she likes getting kind of scratched. Like pets that like really get her, um, you know, feeling good. But um, yeah, like she won't like cuddle with anybody. She'll just like if you're you'll be petting her and she'll be kind of chilling there and then she'll just walk away. She'll just get up and leave. And it's like, what a, you know, fucking bitch. <laughs> you're like, I'm a, you're giving you attention and praise, and she'll just walk away. She's always been like that, though. The only, I mean, I just found she likes being scratched. Because her, with how thick her coat is, you gotta, like, if you, like, really get in there with a, like, a good, like, hard massage, basically... Like, on, like, on her flanks, she loves it. Holy fuck, she loves it. This girl goes crazy for it. Okay, let's just make a run for it. I'll take the Scarlet Rot and we'll heal it up later. Don't we all? Yeah, true. Yeah. Dude, like a scalp scratch that just like really gets in there. Holy shit. That, sh that Oh, it's great. That's the hot shit. Okay. All right. All right, Lake of Rot. It's you and me. Let's finish this up. We've done pretty good ex exploring this, but I want to be done with this place. These motherfuckers from the Ool and Old, maybe, like, fucking around with still water down here. Jesus. Get it together. Why do you have this? Okay. A cookbook? 
Let's, I'm curious, the one that's from Lake of Rot, surely you'd think maybe that's down here for a reason. What is, which one is that? 22, right? Oh, okay, so let you build all the rot items. Okay, that makes more, that makes sense to me. All right, rot me again. Go ahead. Ooh, I'm rotted again. I walk through the lake. Got red stuff again. Oh, baby, baby. Ooh, I'm rotted again. I'm above. I'm not that innocent. What is that? Britney Circa? That song came out when I was in... I remember hearing it when I was in art class. So, maybe... Which? I went to two different elementary schools, and I'm trying to remember which elementary school did I hear this. Hmm. I don't remember. Oops, I did it. I can, like, I have a, a single vivid memory of sitting in, in art class. And hearing this song on the television. Did you hear the Jack Black version of it? I did it again on Kung Fu Panda 4. I have not watched any of the Kung Fu Panda m movies. No offense to Kung Fu Panda. I'm sure they're delightful films, but no. I have not, I have not witnessed such a thing. Okay, we're still at the million runes. Let me just double check over here. No, this is where we came in. Is it? No. We went down. We came from up there. Okay, hang on. So, the whole idea of the, of the Lake of Rot is that it's still water. But there's a fucking waterfall. The water is moving. It's flowing. So, why is it rotted down here? <clears throat> Lore Masters? Hello? Don't make me make another post on the Lore Talk subreddit and then get into the semantics about communicating with other human beings and then have to go to my own viewers who I know already will... will... make me feel better <laughs> if I complain to them, okay? I don't want to go through this again. It's a lot for me. Wasn't that a different Britney Spears song? Oops, I did it again, I feel like, was her first one. She's got the basketball. Some of these braziers aren't lit. Excuse me, lore masters. Cloister? <laughs> I don't even know her. Coco, you really didn't put on a good show earlier. Maybe tomorrow. If we're here tomorrow, we'll show him again. Don't sigh at me. That's the other thing. Sometimes if you talk to her, she just goes... Ugh. And then she flops over. It's, I feel like we adopted her and when she was three. And she was... She's pretty well... She, like, she's well behaved. She's trained decently. She doesn't get along with other dogs. But I just find it funny. It feels like she was trained to purposefully, like, spite you. That's the impression that I get. <laughs> Can you get over here? Like, over there? Am I supposed to drop to that? It doesn't look like there's a place to drop to it. Got sent from above. Miss Coco is a dog. I did the voice acting for the death on the of the pests, by the way. The the what are they called? The kindred of rot. I voiced those. They have one line, it's when they die.
Dude, that guy just fall over? Did he, like, trip? What was that? Did y'all see that thing just fall over? I hate this one. Have, this one actually doesn't have that much health. It's gonna explode soon, though. He's a genius. Let's see if we can kill it before it explodes again. Come on! I find it interesting that they still drop golden seeds. Even though they're like clearly horribly corrupted. I realize a lot of big creatures have that swing large appendage, appendage from right to left. Yeah, you, you do start to notice some um, fairly consistent um, movesets. Especially for the big, big enemies. And they try to make them more telegraphed. Because, like, they kind of have to, right? Because, like, they're flipping. It's kind of impossible to see. Um, when you're... You got to get in close and melee them if you're not a ranged build. And then you can't see what they're doing. That's why I complain a lot about the... The ulcerated tree spirits have this move where they explode. And it has a huge AoE and then does... AoE, like, lava spouts as well. So it's just, it just is, feels like bullshit in the sense that you, unless you anticipate it completely, you cannot get far enough away based on the earliest visual tell. You just have to get a, like, you kind of have to know, like, okay, around, like, maybe 60 or 50% health it's going to do this and just start moving away, which is what I just recently did. But there's no way that as soon as you start seeing it doing the animation, if you started running, you could avoid it. You just can't. It's... It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Welcome back, Caleb. Melon is easy with Moog's spear. I tested it before. It's OP. Yes. I think Moog's spear is widely considered the best weapon in the game. I think Rivers of Blood is one of the easiest to use weapons in the game, but I think Moog Spear is widely considered the best, strongest weapon in the game. Granted, it doesn't work on everything, because not everything can be bled. Is that a dagger? Dagger I hardly know her. <laughs> Used by heretics, crafted from the relic of a sealed outer god. The fact that it's it defines them as heretics to me means like it talks about their like rot lords in the past, like people that worshipped rot, but clearly they were never, you know, in the popular cool kids club because they were. It seemed like they are referred to as heretics at all times. And then more implications is when you take this downstream. It's not... It's not rot anymore. I don't know. There's just so much about this underground shit. Naturally, that means that all the enemies in the DLC would be almost immune to bleed. I really wouldn't be surprised. Uh, this is just... FromSoft does this with all their DLCs. They make all the DLC stuff substantially... Substantially uh, more resistant to all status ailments. That's what I have experienced in the past. Dark Souls 2 was the worst offender.
And I feel like this fungus is only found down here. Like, it looks like glintstone, but it's not. It's almost like it's glintstone and rot sort of mixed together. Also, what the fuck is that? Y'all see it? What? Y'all see that light up there? What's going on with that? Maybe it's just a hole in the cavern? I don't know, man. Okay. Estelle. Fun. Fun boss. If you can dodge this. I did. Holy shit. This boss is cool as heck. Um, similar situation with a lot of uh, large bosses is it's hard to get an idea of where they're at. He has a grab attack where he'll he'll disappear and then appear above you, and it's it and he just appears kind of in a random direction and will roast you and it's fucking stupid, man. So, like, here he's going to do this, and he might appear above us. And it's like, yes, this. Because you don't know where he's coming from. And it does huge damage, too. And it can one-shot phantoms. I, I hit the dodge button. Now I'm over... I'm overestimating it. Ooh, no, I'm alive. I thought he grabbed me. That's not a grab move. Okay, this, I'm just going to try and run past him. This is his spooky transition move. Hit him in the hands. Nope. That's another one where, like, even if you start moving as soon as there's a tell, it's, it's like... It's like they made the AoE just a little too big to the point where it feels like bullshit. I will say this boss, though, has some unmatched visual design. It is cool as heck. And I think it is it is is it in his remembrance where it says that he stole the, he assaulted the night the eternal city and stole its sky. Now Noxtella and Nokrin both have the fake sky, but the nameless eternal city does not have a night sky. So you can't help but wonder is that the one that Estelle assaulted? Cuz the other why would the other ones have the night skies? If Estelle's an alien monster from the stars, why is his head shaped like a human skull? Maybe life on the lands between was seeded from the stars. And we are... We look like them. They don't look like us. Okay, we... Oh, we have to go get the ring. Forgot about that. Maybe the mushrooms extract the rot so further downstream the water is clear. Actually, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the mushrooms seem unique to the rot. Like, all of Kaelid is covered in kind of those gross pustules and mushrooms. So I assume that that's what they are, and then there's glintstone on top of them. But also, that might be some sort of... Maybe the glintstone as well might be some sort of filter for the water. Where's my ring? I still have mini Ronnie in here too. I think if you sit at this grace, she'll talk to you, maybe. 
Mini Ronnie will speak to you a few times here. No, she's already gone. She's gone. She's not going to talk to us. Mushroomen are also worshippers of the Scarlet Rot, so that makes sense. Yeah. It seems like the po like poison, mushrooms, and Scarlet Rot are all linked in some way. It's just sort of this idea of rot followed by rebirth. Oh, shit. We have the sewers to do, too. Oh, no. Let's go upgrade our Bloodhound Fang. Coco is now next to me snoring. She's cute. Okay. Now we just need our sombers to get up there. I'm not too worried about my seal. Are you here for spirit tuning? I need to level up the imps too. For that's for later, but we do need to do it. Should we just le keep leveling up Nephili? I feel like Nephili is probably the best spirit summon that we have, so we should just go for it. There we go. Um, I think I need to put some points into mind so that I can actually cast some spells and use my Ash of War more frequently, too. Um, I don't love that, but I think it needs to be done. I think I looted everything from the lake. So we have the sewers and we have mountaintops. Noble sorcerer's ash. I mean, aren't there there's wandering noble ash too. It's so stupid. Some lore say the real city is Noxtella. Could be. Um we could also go and finish Blythe's. Like we can go and let Blythe out and then he'll get killed. And then EG will get killed and everybody's sad. I don't like doing it. Oh, there you have you heard? Along the dark path of it would not have been as Lady Rani's view and my purpose. I've served Lady. It has been a long now, Lady Rani. I pray that you serve her well. Lady Rani, along the now, Lady. I pray that. Okay. Um, what I hate too is. When EG dies, he's covered in black flame, and he's got a bunch of the dead um, black knives around him. Like, was this just a mistake that they made? Like, shouldn't it be red flame? Because it's destined to death? But he's covered in, like, the black flame of the godskins. I feel like if it was a mistake... Then they would have fixed it in an earlier patch, right? Wait. I thought you could talk to Blythe in here. Maybe we have to finish Ronnie's quest first. Or did he escape on his own and he's already loose? Minnie Ronnie will speak to you at her tower's grace after her quest line is fully complete. Okay. Maybe Melina is the Glomide Queen. What do you think about that? Um, I think the strongest evidence for that is the fact that when she opens her eye, it is, it is twilight. Sorry, but I don't, I don't need to listen to his speech. We're just gonna kill him. Um, it is, you know, sort of a twilight. Which is kind of like what Gloam, the color Gloam should be. So he escapes the Ever Jail his own damn self. So I don't have to feel bad. I don't have to feel bad for have letting let him out so that I have to kill him. He got out on his own. He got out on his own. And then also, again, there's dead black knives around him. And it makes me wonder, is it because of this whole thing with the, um, 
like he's a shadow and he can't fight what the two fingers have programmed him to do. Because like, but then we come to EG, and he's not dead yet, but he will be. And it's the same thing. It's like the Black Knives were sent after him. Yeah, so I think we rest now. See, and he's... He's sort of sitting like Godwin, with his head weirdly tilted. But he's in... Again, I feel like... If this was a mistake then they would have remedied it. In a patch. But he's, he's covered in black flame. And that's one of those things, Then they'll never do it. But you just wish that they would come out and just be like, hey, no, it was supposed to, this was like a mistake, straight up. Because <laughs> now instead it's like, well, do we make crackpot theories about the black knives being related to the godskins in some way? And the Glomide Queen? Okay, so that's done. So now let's go and do, I guess we can do the, whatever it's called, Sirius, whatever. That whole area up there has like two or three things to do. It's like, rel it's a relatively large area for what it is, so. So, like, the fact that Blythe was also mad, and he killed the... Like, was it that the Black Knives were there to kill Ronnie? And Blythe just happened to be there, and he's upset because of the whole Two Fingers conundrum that he's facing? Or did they come to kill him, and Ronnie sent them to kill him, and also E.G.? I don't know, man. I finished Elden Ring three times, and the more I play, the more I feel like the story wasn't done. I know DLC and all, but I feel many things changed, and they didn't connect the dots correctly. Um, I don't know if you've played FromSoft's other titles, like in the Dark Souls series, but they're all like this. And it's hard to know what is purposeful, and what, like, what was purposefully left undone, and what was changed last minute, for whatever reason. So I, I feel ya. I understand what you're saying. Um, it's hard to not feel like it's... Um, incomplete. But I think there's a lot of things as well where it's... It's complete. Um, and then they purposefully remove a shit ton of stuff. Dragon. Dragon. Bleed. Nope. Dude, you killed a- you're killing wildlife! What are you doing? Only I'm allowed to do that. Dude, this MFR has one of the coolest moves with the glintstone sword that he swoops down with. We can maybe see if we can get him to do it, though it might also one-shot me, so maybe let's not try and bait it out. Have some raisins, buddy. I know you love them. That that. <laughs> It's a cool ass move. Wait. Raising it up. Raising it up. Torrent, stay stay healthy. We need ya. Oop. What's he doing? Oh, I don't like- I don't know what that is, and I don't like it, so I'm gonna move- Oh my god! Ah! Dude, I just fed him some raisins. He got kicked off immediately. Slash him. Slash him. Keep slashing! One more! One more! It's 
just that easy. Dude, I should be having the gold foul feet before I kill these things. It's late enough into the game. It seems like they drop an ass ton of runes. Might as well. Okay, there's a lot to do on this place. Um, I think we want to get down here early and activate it because the turtles are actually all over the whole fucking place. And I don't remember where they're at. I've been wondering, how do you feel about George R. R. Martin's involvement in this game? Do you feel like his involvement added a lot? Been reading Clash of Kings and been making me think of Elden Ring a little. There's a lot, yeah, There's. I, I feel like there's a lot of influence you can see from him. I get the impression that FromSoft sort of made the mythology and George R. R. Martin built the actual, like, dynasties, like the, like the intrigues and such. And then FromSoft chose what to keep and what to rip out on purpose so that the player wouldn't get the full picture. Elden Ring feels the worst. Uh, yeah, El I mean, Elden Ring is just huge. There's so many different things. But, I mean, I... I know Tarnished Archaeologist can be considered controversial, but he put out a great video about how... Um, the reason that the way that the stories are kind of conveyed to us in these games is... Fun, because it's also... Oh, my gosh. It's also how um, real history works. Like, this stuff happened. We have some primary and secondary sources. But it's not like there's anybody that exists that can just tell us the story. At least, I mean, in Elden Ring, technically, there are people that could tell us the story, but they choose not to. Whereas, like, again, in real-world history, we have these very sort of nebulous and somewhat disconnected clues. And then historians, archaeologists, anthropologists try to put the story together. And it's, you know, it's these overlapping fields of study that have been, you know, working for generations. And these games bring out the pseudo-intellectuals pseudo in all of us as we try and piece it together ourselves. No! Fuck off. Stupid revenants. People told me you're scary. Those are pretty scary enemies, just because they can stun lock you. They roll catch you and then stun you. You can't get out of it. Where was the... Stone Sword Lord. The world's asking you to investigate and learn what happened, just as anyone would coming into a new place. And I think the frustrating thing, too, is there's just there's never going to be a definitive answer for a lot of it, too. And I would say I was going to say some people find that frustrating, but like I'm some people. I also find it frustrating, but I also have learned to appreciate it. Because that also is kind of what breathes some longevity into the games. Because you can discuss it forever and then someone notices some small weird detail that hadn't been discussed before and then that triggers a whole recontext re -context of everything. It's... Uh, I don't know. It's really fun. That's why I, I had spoken about how, like, I really enjoy it. Like, for me, it's about finding the right lens to view all the evidence through. And, like, I sort of feel like that's how a lot of um, modern-day history and historiography works. That they, they fall from above you? I didn't know that. That's cool. All right, Revenant. You, got, you earned a point in my book. You're cool. Um... Another one. Another one. Is like, for example, the concept of historiography, I don't want, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, so I may be totally off when I say, like, it's a fairly new idea in the sense that, like, sure, people have been criticizing the methods of studying history for a long time, but what's relatively new 
And what gets criticized a lot for the wrong reasons is is the idea of, like, gender studies or, like, African-American studies or, like, you know, name, an, name an, a group. Name a historically disaffected group and, you know, add studies and then that's, like, memed on. But in the from the perspective of history, right, up until more recent decades, everything was sort of viewed through what sources we had and what sources did we have. The people who were able to read and write and record history and leave things for us today to see. And from that perspective, that gives us a lens to view history. But that lens is very narrow in the sense that we only have the view of those people. So the idea of being able to look at sources that look at what poor people's experiences were in, I don't know, fucking Rome, or women's experiences in the Abbasid Caliphate, um, what slaves' experiences were like, you know, in name any period of history. Like, finding sources that, that give us a point of view through those experiences allows us to create different lenses. And as you look at history through different lenses, then you begin to... Yeah, I... Correct, Brett. Um... <laughs> That's a secret. Um, that's how you begin to get a different and maybe clearer picture of what actually life was like. And so, like, history, I, I've said this before, but history is not about what happened when. Because in many ways, we can never truly know that. Um, it, it really just depends on the veracity and the context around the sources that we have and if you just if there's a period in time where you just have one book written by one guy well that's that's all you've got that's it so you can't you can't pretend to say we know what happened let's put it in a textbook and have students memorize it it, it, it would be it's like its own field of study to dig into that more and find connecting secondary sources to put put together a picture and in many ways, that's what these games ask you to do, which is kind of insane, but a lot of people love it. And I think what people may not realize when they're doing that and when they're sort of theory crafting is you are doing what a historian is doing in real life. I mean, you're not being as rigorous, and it's a video game, so... But, like, it's the same concept. History is not just learning about memorizing what happened at, at certain places at certain times. It's, it's very much understanding how do we know... Or how do we think we know what happened at certain times? And that, by extension, is way more interesting. And in many ways, um, allows you or should allow you to appreciate the study of, again, like, historically disaffected groups. Because if we look at things through those lenses, we might get a much different and more interesting and more complete picture about what we know happened when. And that goes along with all the different biases and such that you might see when you're reading a primary source or a secondary source from a specific time. So not only do you have to contend with that and say, like, okay, well, who, who wrote this? What, who, you know, what, what do we know about them? What kind of biases would we expect from them? Do we have secondary sources that connect and reference this person? Did those sources take into account any potential biases? Etc, etc. Oh, who studied this field before? What were their biases? You enter historiography territory where there were other historians who studied these things, but they themselves may not have had the, the sources that you now have, and you're sort of reviewing, you know, maybe this person wrote this in the 50s, and they had a way different view on colonization and race relations and imperialism in the 50s compared to now. So it's just like, it's a totally different picture on how you can view like, well, okay, they wrote this paper in the 50s, given what biases we know that they had at that time, what uh, what can we take from what they wrote? And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and going back and back and back, secondary sources, primary sources, over and over and over again. And that becomes sort of this layered historiography. And that, by extension, is way, way, way more interesting than, like, the Roman Empire existed from this time to this time, and the decline of the Roman Empire was because of the Huns and because of, uh, you know, mass migration. You know what I mean? Like, that's not really that interesting, honestly. <laughs> you gotta ask yourself, how do we actually know that? 
some asshole probably wrote it down, but who was that asshole? How do, how do we trust them? How do we know what they said is... could be considered accurate? The mistake people make is they overcorrect way too much and assume that just because something isn't dominant, that means they're 100% telling the truth. I mean, not in my experience. I guess if, you're, if your lens is looking at modern culture war issues, sure. But like from the perspective of history, absolutely not. It's just about, again, adding a new lens. I don't know how many academic history papers you've read, but I, I don't think that that's something that is considered an institutional problem. But I understand what you mean, again, in terms of overcorrecting, and then overcorrecting back, and then overcorrecting back again, and it's a pendulum. Okay, these things are all over the island, or this plateau, I should say. Your degree is in history? I see. Undergrad in history, or are you a historian? Actually, I'm curious. I mean, if you don't mind sharing, do you... I guess you don't have to be specific. Are you able to use your degree in a, in a career? Because I know, like, I think a common thing with the arts in a general sense is, like, how do you apply it? I think history is definitely one where there's a struggle to map. But the rigor that goes along with it, again, is... It's a lot different than I think is the cliche, which is... Well, we're just memorizing stuff. So there's three turtles. I might just look it up. I know one is at the top of a spirit spring. Not at all, but sort of. My work now is run a control room in an industrial plant. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I just... I think it's a shame. I think that hiring managers need to... I wish hiring managers would appreciate... Um, would appreciate degrees like that because there is a lot of rigor. I mean, you know, because you have the degree. There's a lot of rigor that goes into these topics. Again, I think it's just this concept of like, oh, you just wanted to learn about history and you just sort of like learned about medieval warfare. And it's like, no, no. Like, it's very much, it very much teaches you how to formulate an argument based on primary and secondary sources. And to do that, you need to understand what primary and secondary sources even are. So, again, that's done through the lens of, yes, memorize these things, but it's constantly asking the question when you have to write an essay, which is to support, like, okay, yes, explain this thought process or, like, explain what went on regarding this topic in this time period in this place. When you do that, the only way you can do that is by formulating an argument using sources. And again, it's training, it's teaching your brain how to think in that way. And I think that skill is largely undervalued because it, it's a, it's a pretty in-depth critical thinking process that people who don't go to college in general may not have. I mean, you can learn it not going to college, but the whole point of going to college is to teach you to think and do that kind of stuff. So I think I think a, a common semi misconception about college too is like, oh, you'll never use this stuff, and it's like, well, sure, like I'm, I may not be using the material itself, but by going through the rigor of these courses, you have now been taught how to think from different perspectives, 
it's about a diversity of thought. I know diversity can be a scary word, but it's about a diversity of thought internally that allows you to problem solve way more effectively. Which is why you tend to be eligible for more skilled jobs. But it's hard to break that down for anti-college people. Especially because it sounds woo-woo and pretentious. But the reality is, if you spend four years in school learning things, you're tra you're just you're training your brain to think. If you spend four years instead in the job market, you will have four years of experience, which is incredibly valuable for that specific skill set. Whereas going to college for four years makes you, in general, sort of a more well-rounded individual who can be trained to do more high skill labor instead of one specific thing that you have since gotten experience in. Both are completely valid paths. But I think there's, you know, there's a reality to debt, the debt, and there's a reality to... your earning potential. And you have to take both into consideration when you decide whether you will or will not go to college, if you can afford it. But I feel like there's a really big anti-college trend that's happening. Lately. Um, and a huge part of that is just because of the absolute waste in university administration. And... I don't blame people for seeing the cost and being like, fuck that, I don't need that. But again, it's, it's about earning potential. Even with debt, your earning potential will, depending on your degree, be higher even with that debt in over the span of your lifetime. So it's kind of like, okay, well, if I can afford to take on the debt and I don't have to take out private loans, which would, you know, the... The cost of private, like the interest rate on private loans is too high. I, would, I wouldn't do that, but. I'm looking for this asshole. I haven't found a single turtle. I, I actually have no idea where they're at. I know, again, one is at the, in a, a spirit spring, but. I think college works for certain people, the trades work for others. Trade schools, high schools are solid where I'm from, and I'm pretty sure. I agree 100%. I would never tell someone don't go to trade school, but I do think that there's this misconception that it, you should just go to trade school and you'll be making six figures because, like, you'll be a plumber and plumbers are in demand. And that's just factually untrue. I thought that this is the spirit spring where the turtle is. Yeah, there it is. There we go. Um, again, trade school or the, just the trades in general, 100% valid. I would highly encourage people to do it. But don't be fooled thinking that if you become a plumber, you're going to be making 80, 90K really quickly. That's generally for master level folks who own their own business. Um, but if you're if you're going along that path, it's just that's just not the reality. But I think there's a lot of special interest partisan groups that specifically are looking for reasons to tell people not to go to college and using the trades as some sort of high paid excuse. But that's just not the reality. about that. It's a cool move. This, I think this is probably the best Spirit Ash you can get. I mean, it's not this character, but it's a... Son of a bitch. I thought I was far enough away.
damn it. <laughs> I guess I just need to run. I literally just need to run because there's no other way to avoid it. How are you not staggered? This, this She's unstaggerable, I guess. There we go. Avoided. Like a champ. Getting close to the edge here, lady. Watch out. No! <laughs> I swear I was dodged. I hit the dodge button. I did. I toured one here that I offered dental path, mental fab, plumbing, electric, and more, and I don't remember. Yeah, it takes time to work up. Probably classes as well. Once you're actually in the field post high school, my brother got a few certifications. I think here in pay increases. Yeah, exactly. Again, the potential is there. I think it's more, it just depends on, just be wary of how data is presented because I just don't think that it's 100% honest sometimes. <laughs> By the way, I think I have to come back and reactivate this because I went in the ever jail. Because like there's a lot there's a lot of different difference between like lifetime earnings versus like again potential increases and stuff and again i think the difference is not huge and a lot of it comes down to what you go to school for so the answer is never just like yes college is 100 percent the answer all the time but i think there's a lot of people too that would say that it's never the answer and it's stupid to go and it's not worth the money which is also not true but it depends so i just be wary of people who try to be um, insistent that one is the answer 100% of the time. You have to bring up hundreds of thousands of dollars of your own tools? Holy shit. I didn't know about that. I didn't think it would be that much. Oh my gosh. Okay, these Crystallians respawn, so I'm just gonna run by him this time. I mean, one thing that I think we can uh, kind of agree on is that college in a general sense had has like replaced high school and I think that we can push back against that. I don't think that we should just assume that... That, like, if you want to be able to be successful in life, that you must go to college. Similar to, like, you must get married, you must buy a house, you must have kids. Um, things are just so different now, economically, that it's silly to hold people to these specific life paths that are simply not as attainable as they had been in the past. They're just not. Like, the expectation now is if you if you have a life partner, spouse, whatever, live in, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, um, that it's, you both work. Like, it's, it's incredibly difficult to support Two people, let alone two people and a and a kid, three you know, two and a half people, on one person's salary. Like the the time of a you know, the working husband, stay at home mom is it's not as I mean, even if you wanted to do that, it's not as feasible anymore. See you, see you, Vash. Stuck in the 90s mindset as we can make it work with kids' finances. I feel my generation is a little more realistic and safe about it. Yeah, I agree. 
I mean, we're yeah, we're not that far apart in terms of age, so I think I think it's it's definitely like a mid and later millennial mindset, which is I think us, right? You're not Gen Z. You're not like super old Gen Z, right? You're you're millennial. Um But yeah, it's uh Moonfolk runes. There's just like a reality, like it eventually it sets in because you see what your parents did, and I think a lot of kid, a lot of older millennials especially, they grew up in a very traditional household. Their dad worked, their mom stayed at home, and that was that. And so you thought that that's just sort of your your target for success, and then eventually it's like, okay, well maybe my wife doesn't have to stay at home, sure. Um, because we're, you know, we're, we have gender equality now, but then it becomes like, well, we both have to work. Otherwise, we can't maintain the standard of living that our parents had. It's just too expensive. And I think a, a big part, too, in terms of, like, home buying and, and such is... A lot of it is timing. Like, right now is not a great time to buy a house. But, you know, three, four years ago was the perfect time to buy a house. If you could find one and you could make a down payment, which is kind of the key. A lot of people carrying student debt feel like they can't make a down payment. Um, or feel like they can't save to make a down payment. So, they don't do it. Um, but again, there's a lot of education around what it re what's required to buy a house. Before you assume you can't do it or you can do it. Such as, you can buy a house with a 5% down payment. You can. You have to pay what's called PMI, which is mortgage insurance. Which, because you're making a lower down payment, you have to basically make a higher, a slightly higher monthly payment each month because they're afraid you might... I mean, it's basically to insure the loan against potential default because you couldn't prove that you had enough liquid cash to make a higher down payment. I don't love this. I don't necessarily agree with this, but like I'm just saying, I think a lot of people don't even know that this is a thing. Now, on the other hand, if you can pay a 20% down payment, you don't have to pay PMI at all. So either, I think a lot of people are in either camp. They think I need to make a 20% down payment and I can't afford that. So I can't get a house. On the other hand, I think you have people who think, well, as long as I make a 5% down payment, I'm fine, not realizing that the consequence is your monthly payment is higher with PMI. So, like, you kind of need to understand both routes, and I think a lot of people either know one or the other. And also now, like, interest rates go up, and you hear about this in the news, where there's inflation, so they raised interest rates. You don't really understand what that means or why that matters. Um, it matters because um, when interest rates go up from the Fed, then your interest rates for a potential mortgage go up. So your lifetime value of the loan that you owe on your house is going to be substantially higher. Like, I think it's something like for every percentage point, is it percentage point or 0.1 percentage point? I think it's for every percentage point increase in your 30-year mortgage loan, that's $10,000 more dollars um, that your loan accrues over its lifetime. It might be more than that, actually. I have to look it up. But basically, you think of it in terms of, like, you know, I could get a loan for my house for, like, 2.2%. It was insane, actually. Like, I thought it was a, I thought it was a scam when they told me that I could get 2.2%. My credit is great. My wife's credit is great. So we got a great loan. And again, it, then when they said that, I'm like, this can't be right. Like, nobody would loan... No one, no one would loan money at 2.2%. So, like, it's a no-brainer. If you can get money at 2.2% over 30 years, like, fuck. Sign me up. But now, I don't know. Actually, I don't really know what, what interest rates are if you wanted to get a house now. But I'm going to imagine it's going to be around 6 or 7%. That's, you know, that increases the lifetime value of your house to, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 more than what I paid for my house. So not only is the sticker price of the house the same because prices haven't really gone down yet for home selling prices, you have a bunch of people who bought when I did who would never want to sell because that means I now have to buy a new house at a higher interest rate when I'm currently locked in at 2.2%. So you have 
lower supply, less people moving, willing to sell. And then you have a bunch of buyers who can only be buying at a 6% rate. Like, it kind of... It's just not a balanced market right now. And so until the actual cost, like the list price of homes, starts going down in response to this, the markets, the, the home buying market is just bad. It's just bad. But the problem is prices aren't going to go down because, again, I'm locked in at a super low interest rate. I'm not incentivized to sell. So why would I try and sell my house at a lower cost or lower price? That's just not, it just doesn't make sense. So, again, you just have these misaligned incentives right now in the housing market. Uh, I'm going to look up where these turtles are. It's for... It doesn't tell me what the rise is called. I'll just say Moonlight Altar... Turtles. There's an upwind in some trees which allows you to hit it. Okay, the third one's located in the s southeast of the plateau. Just follow the path and drop down some cliffs. Okay, I think I. Okay, I see. I just got, when I went to look this up, I had a Reddit notification. I'm like, what nerd wants to fight now? And it was just, it's saying that it was my cake day. I'm like, who fucking cares? <laughs> don't remind me how long I've been on this platform, okay? I don't want to know. In Canada, people make profit from houses, so they jack up the price to make money. I mean, yes. I mean, that everybody makes money from houses. To say that they that they increase the price for profits is a bit reductionist. They increase the price based on what people are willing to pay. If you increase the price too much, then people won't be willing to pay. But I think a big problem is when interest rates were super low, a lot of homes were bought up by big corporations that now rent them. And not only do they rent them, but they rent them with really scummy practices. And that takes those homes off the market. So no actual family was able to buy them. Anyway, I guess my point with all this is... I think... If you're looking to buy a house... The time for it is coming up, but probably not this exact moment. But it should be soon, You'll, we would start seeing some adjustments. Where, again though, you might see like, oh, prices are going down, that's nice. But, if interest rates are super high, keep in mind, again, that's, that's still increasing the lifetime cost of your home. But that's not to say you can't refinance, I guess. But that's assuming rates will go down again to what they were. And I doubt we'd see like a 2% again. I can't wait for the housing crash here. Sorry, but a three-bedroom house for 400k for a cabin. I agree that prices are crazy. I am not hoping for a crash. Nor do I think we're in a housing bubble, per se. Because um, if we were in a bubble, that would imply that there's some sort of practice going on that's going to burst. And I guess the whole point of a bubble is you don't know. <laughs> but, like, in 2008, we can very clearly identify <clears throat> what was going on, what practices caused it. I'm not sure if... I mean, honestly, again, it really was just because we had such low interest rates for so long. I mean, I really think it's that straightforward. I don't think it's that there are predatory loans happening. I mean, there might always be predatory loans happening, but I don't think it's like... I, I, I just think that the economy was running hot when Barack Obama was leaving office. 
Donald Trump kept rates low and did not pump the brakes, which is what you're supposed to do. Again, you don't want the economy running too hot for too long because then you get inflation. And then add in a bunch of tax cuts that weren't offset by spending cuts. And you have, number one, massive inflation. Not to mention all of the federal and state spending that needed to happen because of COVID. So you have massive inflation. You have to raise interest rates in response to inflation. But if you would have raised interest rates before, then we probably could have avoided a lot of the heartache now. Instead of going to 6 or 7%, maybe we could have been we could have settled at like a 3.5 or a 4 at most. Instead now, you know, hopefully we don't trend to like what it was in the 80s where, you know, my parents had they had like a 13% variable rate on their house. It was insane. I mean, they refinanced eventually, but still like that's crazy. <laughs> Just like but back then, the expectation was you get married, you buy a house. There's a ton of pressure. So you just did it without the, you know, fully understanding maybe what the lifetime cost of your loan would be. And I'm glad some of that societal pressure is easing up. Because it's like, look, it's just not realistic. Why would I waste my money when I could just rent right now? Rent prices are way more responsive to market forces. Or they're, they're a lot faster to respond. Hous housing prices will come down slowly. But not as fast as, again, renting... Um, not as fast as the rental market. So, like, you could rent now. Prices have started to come down there. It's still not great, but it's, you know, probably better value than buying. The rate wasn't the same. The formula was different. Isn't it also building cheap, affordable housing doesn't seem bureaucratically possible? I don't know about what you mean when you say bureaucratically, but I will say it's more like developers see way better bang for their buck to build. I think we're done up here, by the way. Um, developers see way better bang for their buck to build like luxury. You want to build those $400,000 units. Uh, because if they're selling, you want to build those because you can build them cheaper and charge more. As long as you have some, like, nicer fixtures and amenities. And you market it as, like, a mid upper middle class suburban safe place to live. Then people, you know, as long as people are still buying those, the demand is there. Then they're way more incentivized to build those. So the question is, what incentivizes lower income housing? And the other problem, too, is the general NIMBY sentiment, not in my backyard acronym, um, which is like, I don't want Section 8 housing in my district because that makes my housing, uh, that makes my housing value go down. And, like, I know there's a lot of pushback to NIMBYs, but it's just a market force. Like, if you're telling me that you want to build something near me that will make my the value of my property go down, of course I'm going to vote against it. But then the problem is, again, you're stuck that way. Like, unless you find a way to, in to incentivize this separately, then no, one ever, no one's ever going to purposefully want to decrease their property value. You, no, nobody will. Why, why would you? You wouldn't do it either. Every, I think if maybe if some people who don't own homes think that they would be super altruistic. But as soon as you sign that piece of paper, it's yours. You're not going to purposefully decrease the value of it. And that's kind of the concept of all NIMBY-related stuff. I think some stuff is worse than others, though, where, like, it wouldn't necessarily affect your property. You're just kind of being an asshole. And in some cases, it might actually make the, the county or the locale more attractive. But they just don't want it because they, it's just like, they don't like the idea, like, oh, there's, 
parking lot on the other side of these woods, and I don't like that. That's too close to my house. Like that's the kind of shit where it's like, if you can, you know, it's not you don't you can't see it. It's not affecting you, but you're just sort of like, wah wah. It's too close to my house. That's, you know, there's no evidence based anything regarding that, but some people vote that way. I don't know. In a, in a general sense, the U.S. has done way better than pretty much the entire rest of the world in the last year. Like, we were heavily expected to have a recession worldwide. The U.S. has mostly avoided that, but the key thing that is not lining up with that... Hell yeah, Ronnie. Is, um, is just how people feel about the economy. And I would argue... Maybe this is a hot take. A lot of how people feel about, like, the economy is a burden and it's pressuring and it's just too much and you can't afford anything and the prices have gone up is not reflective of reality in terms of the economy, but it is reflective in terms of how people feel because of all of the forces in their life that add stress. That is not necessarily just the economy. Relatively speaking, the economy in the U.S. is factually factually i'm telling you it's factually doing well that's not to say that you should feel great about it but like the numbers don't lie but if you feel shitty about it maybe it's not necessarily because of the economy per se it's about all the things tangential to it and how we live our lives now which is a constant state of always on always on always available someone can text you at any time call you at any time you have to renew this service you have to cancel this service you have to exercise you have to be aware of everything you're eating you have to make sure you reach out to your friends you have to make sure to call your mom you have to go to work at this time on this day and you can't be late well maybe you want to work from home this day and you but well you don't want to text your boss that because you don't want to come off too strong and mess with the office culture and again it's just like there's like a wave of constant stress and anxiety that's coming at every person at every time. And then when you think, oh my gosh, look at my grocery bill, even though maybe you are making more than you were last year to kind of accommodate for that, that's just one more thing that gets on the pile. So you can't help but think the economy sucks right now. But frankly, again, the numbers don't lie. It is really good in the U.S., but it doesn't feel that way to people. Because people, and I'm not saying people are, what they're feeling is wrong, but what I'm saying is they're, they're placing their feelings for one thing onto another thing. Like they're sort of transposing the anxiety they feel about all of these things that have to constantly be on a list to keep track of. It's always something, always something. You finally start kind of clearing out your list of to-dos and then something goes wrong and you have to put everything to the side and then you fall behind. You're behind. You have this huge list, but you got to focus on this one thing. Oh, now I got to drive to this other state because I have to see this family member for some... My second cousin's getting baptized. I have to go to that. But I had all this stuff I had to do and I was actually planning to work on the weekend so I could catch up on some stuff. But now I can't do that. I'm going to be more behind when I get back. And now I got to... Oh, I got to remember if I don't... Um, if I don't sign my irrigation services renewal contract they won't come and and turn my sprinklers back on for my lawn and you know what i mean it's just like it's just fucking non-stop it's a barrage constantly of being reminded of things that you need to be doing and you simply can't get to it all with your health your family your friends all of the relationships in your life your job it's just it's just too much and i think people take all of that and they just sort of sum it up and say the economy's bad because I just don't feel good about, I don't feel safe and comfortable in my position in life. And like, dog, I feel that way too. So like, I'm not here to say like, hey, you shouldn't feel that way. But it's more just like, you know, it's better to identify the reason why. Which is, again, probably social media and the demand that we are always available at all times for every person to contact us. And if we don't respond immediately, then 
they're going to assume something is wrong as opposed to just being like, well, you know what? Maybe they'll just text me back tomorrow. Congrats on Amari's engagement. This is like rant number three today. Yeah, and I think this is the best one. The first rant was weak, okay? Talking about like Star Wars nostalgia, okay? We've been through that before. Um, is there anything we can pick up now that it's, um... Now that we finished Ronnie's quest? Oh, we can go talk to her. In Ronnie's Rise. And then I guess maybe we do the sewers, or we can do part of Mountaintop of the Giants? I don't want to do either one. I actually prefer the sewers over Mountaintops. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Jabonomics might be the rant of the week. <laughs> I just think there's like a re there's just a reality that that a lot of folks just refuse to see because you have some people who are obsessed with reminding everyone that the economy is doing good and i feel like maybe i was giving that impression before i came in hot from the other angle too because again the economy is doing really good but that is just simply denying people's reality right now it's just people are just overwhelmed with the amount of shit that they constantly have to do to the point where no one ever feels caught up ever like literally never i cannot express that it's always something I thought I'm upon the order. Mine will be an order, not if I would keep them far from the earth as it is now and have the certainty all become, which is why I would stop. Like, why do you think I come home and I look forward to playing Elden Ring for three hours? It's so that I don't have to think about the shit that I should be doing. And the only reason I feel comfortable admitting that is because I know everybody feels the same way. Everybody has some goofy pattern of avoidance. They do as much as they feel okay doing. And then at a certain point, you just have to allow yourself to take a break and relax and recover some mental bandwidth. But that whole time, you're just reminded like, well, I should be doing this thing or I should be catching up on this thing. I should get a, I should get a walking treadmill for under my desk. It's just always something. Like, even if you catch up on all the active stuff in your life, there's always just something you need to be thinking about. What's the new culture war thing? What's the stupid geopolit... No, I shouldn't say stupid. It's stupid to think that you need to care about everything. What's the geopolitical thing that I need to have an opinion on now, even though there's no impact I could have on this? That's the other thing, is we're always encouraged to have a strong opinion on fucking everything. <laughs> And, like, I like engaging in current event chats, topics, and stuff. But what I don't like is, again, feeling pressure from... I don't want to even say my peer group, but sort of like a nebulous, tangential group of people that I align with sort of, I guess, politically and socially, just sort of across the country. Where, like, again, I'm sort of encouraged to hold all these beliefs at the same time and hold them strongly enough that I would be willing to defend them at any point. And it's like, dog, I don't got time to like research this, okay? I don't have time to do this. Coco, I literally didn't move. I didn't even move. I've been ranting and raving this whole time. You jumped up. And I don't, I, I, sometimes I wonder, is this just like, is this me getting older or is just, is this just what the world is now? Because I feel like, again, it's a product of smartphones and social media. Because it's just, if, like, we're just constantly always reminded that we're doing something wrong. Like, literally at all times, whether it's regarding the way you interact with people or it's with taking care of yourself and your health or, you know, how you behave at work. Like, it's just hard to find peace. I guess that's really what, what it comes down to. It just feels like it's hard to find peace. Okay. A 
here I thought you came here to hang out with us. No, I mean, look, I... Uh, uh. Well, I mean, that's part of it, right? <laughs> if I didn't want to hang out with you, then I wouldn't be streaming this. Trying to, you're trying to get me. Like, I think one of the, one of the worst phrases that I can hear uttered at me is, Oh, did you remember to blank? Question mark? Because I feel like as soon as the question starts from anybody in my life, I know the answer is probably no. <laughs> and it scares the, the crap out of me. <laughs> Again, I, I, I mentioned earlier in the stream, I don't talk about it very much publicly, but I do have ADHD. It's not very severe to the point where it hugely impacts my life. I don't know if this is a function of that, but I, I get the impression everybody feels this way, but it just feels like there's just so much. Like, so much that it doesn't really fit on a calendar. just being very aggressive with these guys is the way to go because they just deal a ton of damage. We just try and take them out quick. Did you remember to be stressed today? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there's a lot of days I feel better than others. And honestly, I think this isn't true for everyone, but personally, there's like a level, I think it's called you stress versus distress. There's a level of stress that we all sort of feel where we actually might feel like we perform better. I think I'm dead. Let's get out of here. That was close. And I will say, like, with everything going on with my job lately, I'm in the solid eustress position. It feels great, honestly. Like, I've, I've it's been a long time since I felt like, really stimulated at work. It, it's great. Again, it's rare. And it's, I like, it's a privilege to feel, like, not excited, but just, like, fulfilled at, like, your 9 to 5. That being said, it's a fucking lot. <laughs> so, maybe... Maybe me th with this rant is a product of that and it's just coming out in a different way. I'm not sure. Life's complicated. May as well play some Elden Ring about it. Hell yeah, brother. I'm stuck? Okay. This is why we jump attack. But I guess I answered my own question from earlier in the stream is who has the time to do this shit? I mean, that's why I'm asking the question in the first place is this rant. I'm like, who has time to do that stuff? But here I am talking like, well, you know, we all have our patterns of avoidance and maybe some people's just to go online and give things one out of 10 reviews, <laughs> you know? Maybe it's just that simple. But again, I, I'm not sure if it's like a product of getting older or like I've developed some, some type of anxieties I've gotten older. I feel like when I was in my 20s, like 
mid early 20s i could just go like a whole weekend and speak to no person and just not worry about anything and be like you know whatever it is i'll just do it on monday i could just do that now i just i don't feel like i have that freedom anymore it's just there's just too much to do always to do and i guess take into consideration Trust me, it's not just you. It's a fucking lot is the tagline for life itself. <laughs> Dude, I'm going off tonight. This is some real shit. No more contrarian takes, okay? I now look I'm the now I'm the one going off about all the the institutional disasters. Oh my god, don't get me started. It's an election year in the U.S. And in fact, it's an election year for a lot of the rest of the world this year. Holy fuck. That's one of those things where, like, I'm not the kind of person who's like, don't remind me about politics. I love engaging with politics. I've, I work, I've worked elections before and I'll do it again. I feel great doing it. I feel like there's more in this place, by the way. I'm just looking around because I swear there's more to pick up. I would encourage others to do it. It's very rewarding. You'll meet people in your community. I guess to say that it's very rewarding is... not necessarily true for everyone. But, um... I met some cool... I've met some cool people. And it just felt good to, like, actually work in my local community. Instead of, like, getting mired in federal issues. Which are also important, but, like... There's a limit to how much you can really engage with them. What about the lower... What are the buildings down closer to Shabriri? But the thing about election years is just... Half the time, if you feel like you're getting worked up about something... Just think about all the extra shit you've seen recently, like in the news and online, that probably was created specifically to agitate you, slash me. And that's probably the answer to why you feel like shit. <laughs> that's my thought, at least. I'm, I'm actually pretty confident about that. I think the Twinkler is above us. Maybe below us? Okay, let's go talk to... Sh is Shaburi still here? Or has he left? You're being summoned to another world! I am not PvP spec, no sir. I'll try, though. That's so true about political agitation during election years, but I think it's always an election year these days. Yeah, and don't get the wrong impression, because I am not someone who is, like, <clears throat> not opinionated regarding politics. I absolutely am. But, <laughs> but... Again, there's a, there's some times where it's just like, sorry, buddy. Maybe I should. Did I disrupt the duel? Hey. Hey. I think just that general feeling of of existential dread gets amplified, sort of tangentially, from all the extra pressure that comes from the election year, where it's kind of barraging you from all sides. So even though I like to debate modern issues and culture war bullshit i enjoy it um but there's a there's a limit and typically the closer you get to an election the less control you have to um self-select how much exposure you get blasted with yeah he's still here i think he's gonna stay here until either we burn the tree or we um go to the three fingers 
I'm deciding for the DLC if I want to go Frenzied Flame. I mean, I can undo it with the needle, but I don't necessarily want to kill Melania until after the DLC drops. So then I won't have the needle to undo the Frenzied Flame. I guess we could... I mean, we could... Well, we have to make the decision before we burn the tree. As someone who's not from your country, I enjoy that you don't rant about it consistently like some do. I mean, my thought is as long as you advertise what kind of kind of content you're making, you know, rant away. But I don't know. I think it's pretty common sentiment that, again, um, there's like sort of a bombardment. And it's kind of what I talked about earlier, too, about people sort of molding and inheriting beliefs from, like, a social group. That happens especially during... Um, there it is. That happens especially during uh, election seasons. You'll notice people around you will start caring a lot more about specific issues kind of all at the same time. <laughs> and you might think, that's curious. <laughs> and it's because there's a concerted long or short-term effort to get people to care about these specific things at this specific time. It's like border policy in the U.S. There's not much incentive to actually fix it because then you would lose a huge election topic that seems to only come up in election years. I mean, it comes up at other times, but it's it becomes like a culture war issue close to election time. And again, then there's very little incentive to actually fix it. I think most people agree, like, these can be challenging conversations. They don't have to be hostile, but they're, they're challenging, right? If you're willingly opening, open to talking to folks different from yourself, like, that's great, but it is still draining to do. Like, it takes a concerted effort to go in and know that someone is going to be, to challenge you. And then to not lose your shit, too. So especially around this time of year, we sort we generally just choose not to do it, understandably. Fuck that. <laughs> you need issues to show that you are useful? I, I kind of agree. I sort of feel like, at least in the U.S., we're at the point where you need issues just to agitate people to vote against the, the opposing side. If you pick pro you take problems, you blame the other side on them, you're agitating your voter base into voting against them. And I would prefer that we had things that we could encourage people to vote for instead of against. But I feel like we're strongly in the vote against part of history at this point and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, but also, I am absolutely not creating a false equivalence. Um, again, I have my strong opinions, and I don't have to dive into them, but I am not someone who says both parties are the same in this country. They are not, in my opinion. This guy's got a ton of health. Ah! That scared the shit out of me. Oh my gosh. Dude, we just gotta get some jump attacks going on this guy and it's gonna be fine. Or we just kill him. It's fine too. Don't look for people who agree with you on the same problems. Look for people who agree with you on the solutions. True. Or, or I mean, yes. And 
Um, look for people who are willing to find solutions, who are willing to compromise on solutions. It's just way too much like, where, like, yes, we look, a problem. You should be mad about that. And you go, yeah, I guess. I'm, I guess I'm kind of upset about that. Can we do something about it? Um, well, you know, that's not what we're talking about right now. <laughs> Nor will we talk about it when we get voted in. Where is the... Am I crazy? There's a... There is a dungeon, like, right around here. Is it... Was it up there and I missed it? Am I actually crazy? I swear there is a dungeon up here. Like, right here. Oh, it's down here. I'm not crazy. Ho ho. The grave is at the top of the mountain. I'm not sure where the grave is, but I don't look forward to it. <laughs> Pretty much every side dungeon in the mountaintops, I think, is awful. <laughs> They're just really difficult. It sounds like I have folks that generally agree with me in the chat. Again, I, re I respect anybody who doesn't because it would be way too much effort to try to... <laughs> I'm not here to debate people as we play Elden Ring. We're just having fun. But I, I like to approach things with some practicality. I think that's also been a semblance of getting older. I used to be much more... Um, I don't even know if I'd say I was extreme. I just... I was way more interested in sort of accelerationist type remediations to problems. And now I've I've settled on a lot more practical type stuff, but I'm still very firmly in one camp. But, you know, again, when you work when you do like election work in your community, it's important to cuz you like at least where I live, I assume this is pretty much every state, you have to have representatives from both parties. And so like you're forced to work with people from a party that you're not affiliated with and you spend the whole day with them and you just realize like, oh, this is just like a completely normal person. Now, do I think everybody is a completely normal person? In the United States, absolutely not. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. No, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to go up there. Actually, I think I have to go up there. Yeah, like, we had people come in, it was the, I think it was 22 midterms when I was working it, and we had people come in that were just, like, grilling us about the way the printer worked and stuff, and it's like, look, if you, if you are skeptical about the process, then work the day. Why don't you show up here and work, six, I'm not joking, it's 16 hours, we were there from, like, 5 a.m. till, like, 9 or 10 p.m., and I'm like, if you're skeptical about it, then work it so you understand what's what happens here. Because it's incredibly rigorous. That's why it takes so long. You have to have checks upon checks upon checks upon checks. Duplicate things. So that you have backups and it's just, it's a lot.
So I know we have to take the, the upper elevator down. But just for the sake of exploring the whole place. Lucky that didn't hit me through a bowl. Okay, we came from that way. I know, Coco. You're grumbling. Incrementalism is dangerous too. It keeps people from actually taking risks because there's always tomorrow. I 100% agree. Um, it's just, I, it's about not using it as an excuse to not do anything, <laughs> right? It's important to have a plan and the plan has to be realistic. And the by realistic, what I mean is you have to understand where the country is so that you can sort of meet them at least sort of where they're at. I don't think there's any place to go up here, yeah. Which I think is what the problem with accelerationism is, is you're never gonna get the buy-in you need to make it happen. As nice as it would be, you're just not gonna get, whoops, you're just not gonna get enough people on board in the type of system that we have, namely a constitutional republic, because if you call it a democracy for some reason, people will correct you, even though functionally it has no impact on the conversation. Um, you know, you need, <laughs> you need some amount of representational support to get things through. You can't just force people to be like, oh, we have Medicare for all now. Oh, is this the, is this the dungeon that makes you think you're going in circles? This actually is one of my favorites. I take everything I said back. I actually really like this one. Look at look at De Beard in the in the chat. He's work he's worked the he's, he she has worked the election. Hell yeah. Let's be honest, if you're watching this stream, there's like a ninety nine percent chance that you are male. Nothing wrong with that. It's just analytics. Okay, so I think we have to drop. Maybe this... Is this the one that makes you think you're going in circles? I remember the land squirts. Oh, well, maybe not. Because you have to go down... I guess the only way to go now is down the elevator. We've made a whole circle around this. I think the one that makes you think you're going in circles is in the... Um... Sewers. I also noticed that the loudest voices that complain about moderate solutions also never go out and create the conditions that move the desired policies forward. Absolutely true as well, yes. Like, I can respect... Maybe we haven't been through here. Maybe we are in the dungeon that makes us think we're going in circles. Because this these enemies would be dead if we're not going in circles. So yeah, we're making the loop right now. That's exciting. I do like this dungeon. But I mean, that's kind of what it comes down to with how what I was talking about regarding, you know, election years and 
getting sort of activated is a lot of it just comes down to like you're made to get upset about things but there's no there's no prescription there's no solution it's not like vote for us because we have this plan to fix it i mean sometimes there is and th that's usually a little more obvious but that's what i mean it feels like a lot of the times you're getting fed outrage with no substance and people still vote for it <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's the state of the country. That's what I'm saying. Like, you still have to be practical. Like, it's frustrating, but, you know, a huge chunk of one of the parties is where it's at, and that's the reality right now. So we got to figure out what we do from there. Okay, so we went up and hit the dead end. So we go back instead. Am I able to jump underneath the elevator? It looks like it. Yeah. Oh, shit. Dude's motherfucking... He's metal! Ah! Shh. Don't do it. We can go down even more. I want to say there's a fire prelate down there, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is definitely the one that makes you think you're going in... ...in circles. Just because the enemies are the same, but one thing that you learn after going through it once is... ...the repeat enemies are an indication that it's actually not a circle, because... ...they don't- the enemies shouldn't be respawning. Yeah, this is, I think, uh... Okay, that's where we were. I still want to go back and take the elevator underneath as well. Might as I guess we should just fight the boss. I don't remember where the fucking door is. Politics just makes me feel tired today. There's a reason they call it doom scrolling, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if anything, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm just out there fighting because I get I guess I get some dopamine hits engaging with people about it, but at a certain point it's it's you know, there's no point. But I will push back to some common misinformation that I see. Or like if you have people who tend to be on the fringes who try and be like, your vote doesn't matter, and it's like I mean, from a certain point of view, if you live in New York, maybe you're vote towards the federal election doesn't matter, but you know, we saw New York actually had a pretty big impact on the outcome of the House of Representatives in 2022 and the seat difference was only like three or four. Oh, great. But I, I agree with you, and it's just like, it's a, it's like a, it's as Cookie Monster says, it's a sometimes food. Sometimes I'm in the mood, and sometimes I'm just like, this is just too much right now. I can't, I can't handle this right now. This is just stupid. I'm gonna get blown up. That's all right. I, we'll just sip, sip through it. They can only say a vote doesn't matter if they do, in fact, matter. I mean, yeah, the thing that I've always thought about, too, is if your vote didn't matter, why do so many people want to take it from you? Why do so many people want you to not do it? What's the point in telling someone their vote doesn't matter? What does it matter to random streamer person online whether you vote or not? They, they, the only incentive is for, is for them to get you to not vote because they know that it has an impact in some way. And it's hard to feel that impact. I understand. There's 330 million people in this country. But there are some... There are some localities that we've seen that, like, the difference is, like, five votes. Or, like, three votes. That shit happens. 
especially local elections. That's the other thing, is the idea that your vote doesn't matter. It's easy to feel that way in a federal election. But, like... It's a federal election, dog. You know, like... <laughs> You still want to show up so you can vote in your local elections. Because you're voting on, like... Budgets and propositions and stuff that will have a direct impact on your life. And that's the thing, too. A lot of people just discount how much of an impact local and state elections have on them. Dude, he never realized that I could jump over the whip. He didn't even think about the fact that I could just jump over the whip. Okay, let's just manually... Let's just walk over this. Dude, it's late. I don't give a fuck. Let's go. My wife's out of town. <laughs> I'll sleep in tomorrow, wake up, take the dog out, go to my sax lesson. And I can tell her. I can tell my instructor. I can be like, dude... I practiced two and a half hours, but well, not two. Maybe I practiced two hours between Thursday and Friday, getting ready for my recording. That's the hard part too, man. I've been so busy at work. I get home, and we like got to make dinner, and we got to clean up, and then it's like, okay, it's already kind of late, and I just like, you know, it's hard to just muster up the motivation to practice, and then I have to like show up on Saturday and be like, yeah, you know, I just didn't really have time, but I did have time, but I just didn't have the, I didn't have the energy, and like, but you generally aren't going to say that, right? I guess, it, you know, energy is a function of, of densified time. <laughs> it's stupid flowery vernacular, but, like, you know, if you're just super busy for most of the day, you get home, you're like, I just don't have it in me, man. But no, I can show up. It's like going to the dentist and being like, that's right, motherfucker. I do floss every day. You can't, you got nothing to say. Now I can go to my lesson and be like, I do, I actually practiced a lot this week. Felt great. Let's see what's over here. Wait, did we ever get an answer on what formic rock is? I saw I saw someone mention how ants or some insects can spew formic acid. I assume that that's what creates the formic rocks in this instance, in this fictional world that we have going on here. All right, Millicent is gone. The word I'm looking for is motivation. I mean, yeah. Pretty much. It's kind of hard to describe because in many ways, like, I do want to do it. <laughs> I just struggle to start. So I have to thank my friend Psychedelic, who yesterday, via a joke, got me, uh, got me started. Okay, 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 okay. Is this one? No. That's 
smell the ants make? The smell? What? I may be misunderstanding. The smell they make? What, like pheromones? I've never smelled ants. <laughs> We want to go this way first. Well, this leads to the frozen lake. This way leads to Juno Hasla, who we killed already. But I didn't really pick up anything along the way, so we do want to go back this way. When an ant is killed, it can be pretty bad based on the species. Interesting. I, uh, I've never experienced this. It must be like a locale thing. <sighs> Demi humans. I don't know where we get our first somber smithing stone. I think it might be from completing Latena's quest. Because I'm pretty sure you, there's nowhere to get those until Faramazula. Or... Maybe Mogwin Dynasty? In fa I, I don't actually think there are any. I, I don't know. But it's only the super endgame areas. Probably Halig Tree as well. bats. Bat people. Excuse me. What, what am I hearing? What's, what's going on? I feel like I just like hear enemies attacking each other and it's scares me. Yeah, so this is where we fought Juno Hoslo. Dropped by Anastasia Tarnished Eater after her third invasion in... Con okay, so I think there's two we can get in, in uh, Consecrated Snowfield, which is good because we have two weapons. Some ants secrete it from stingers. Formic Rock is the crystallized version. Yeah, they do shoot some stuff at you. You can actually see, you can actually see the Consecrated Snowfields from here. Because there's Castle Soul. You can't see the Halig tree from here, though. Can't see Ordina, either. Liturgical town. Oh, wait, no. That is Ordina, right there. Um, I thought Castle Soul was next to that mausoleum, but it's actually in Mountaintops of the Giants where we're at currently. There's something cool about liturgical town. Like, I understand it just means, like, city relating to scripture in some way or religious practice, but I don't know. That's just, that, that name goes hard. I like it. Is that it? This whole way? I guess we could take the spirit spring up. Hmm. <laughs> Hands? Push your hands this way?
Maybe not. I was like 90% sure there would be hands around here. Almost to that two mil. Is someone a customer? Well. Something else. More hands? I thought we were done. Dude. You haven't even seen the half of it. There's fucking giant ones. They're, I think they're arguably the worst enemy in the game. I, was it Psychedelic who explained how to possibly dodge them? I've never really successfully been able to avoid their attacks. But maybe today's the day. I love that the gauntlets are different for the different... Just why? <laughs> oh, hard to, hard to spot duplicates in here. Just looking at the names, really. I think these are exactly the same. Fire will momentarily stun the giant hands, but it notably doesn't say it for the colossal hands. I think the issue too is you're most likely to encounter them on torrent. And when you do encounter them on torrent, um, that's where you, like, you need to be able to roll. So, like, you want to... Probably if I trigger them, I want to get off torrent. Similar to the big rune bears. I want to learn how to deal with the... I mean, there's only, like, three in the whole game. I just want to learn how to deal with them. There's a big graveyard over here. This is where we can do the jellyfish quest. I think, arguably, we should probably come down through here and then go through the frozen lake and then come up and around and go to Castle Soul. Because now we've sort of skipped and we're on the other side of it all and it's confusing to me. Fire grease? Yeah, we got a lot of that. Grease it up. Use Butcher Blade and have 99 Vigor. That's the best way to deal with every enemy. True. Actually true.
I did get up to 50 vigor before coming to this cursed place. So that's, that's something. It's, you know. Maybe we'll bump up to 60 once we get enough uh, runes. Because the only other thing to do is maybe we get to 40 endurance, get our decks up to the soft cap, and then we can ditch um, Godric's rune. Which we've been using for the whole flipping game. Speaking of, I guess, you know. <laughs> Dude, really? really? I don't know if we'll see the giant colossal hands tonight. They are a little further in. We have the whole frozen lake and stuff. Next time, though. You know, we got a lot still to do. People still out there looking for help, even at this level. I like that. Oh, no, never mind. It's a hunter. Hunter summon. Magma Worm Encounter. Theodorix is in Consecrated Snowfield. And you best believe we're going to lure it into the octopus. Hmm. <sighs> I actually quite like the term recusant because again it's like it's like they've recused themselves from like the tarnished obligation and society I'm coming Doigle They put me so far away from you. Oh, you're lucky. America's hammer. Hey. A recusant is someone who's refused to convert, mostly used by Catholics when England became a Protestant majority nation. Yeah, I guess I was thinking it more along the lines of like, yeah, to recuse oneself. Like to purposefully not take on the responsibility, I guess, you know, conversion, submission. Golem's halberd. I learned that it must be said golem. If you say golem, then somebody out there will correct your pronunciation, weirdly enough. Of all the things, too. That's the one that is just weird. Like, that real, that's the one you care about? Golem? Oh, no, I forgot. I feel like I always forget this one. Okay, well, we'll have to come back and do that. Maybe I'll just go and grab the grace up here and then perhaps stop for the day. I am starting to get tired. AoE is the way to go in PvP. I 100% agree. Seems like there's just some 
PvP builds, I mean, just grab Moog's spear. I mean, it's just you can't get it till later because it takes a while to get to him and be able to kill him. But if you can, like, summon in a, a friend who's super overleveled to do that, and then you get Moog's trident thing, then you just run in, you know, to three... to a host of blue and his furled finger, and then you just... Kill them all. That's what player trade is for, yeah. I, can you trade um, boss weapons? That's nice. Simon. Oh my. I'll wait. There you go. Okay. 1.7, we're getting there. Bit by bit. This zone is actually, like, decently linear, weirdly enough. I think, because, like, you come up here, you got a big lake. There is stuff that you can do down in this direction to get to the Giant's Forge, but, like, this is very self-contained up through Castle Soul. And then... As you come down here, you go through, like, a graveyard... You can, like, you, like, loop around and up to get up to these areas. I guess you could do this as part of Castle Soul, but, like, yeah, this is pretty much all self-contained up here and very straightforward. And then going this way, there's like, it's, like, a big graveyard, I think, and then the actual giant's part, which is a nightmare. But I think we'll do that tomorrow. Thanks uh, for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. We had a lot of rants today. Some hit, some didn't. You know, you can't you can't land them all. You can't land them all, but they, you know, pretty pretty good. <laughs> I'll see you probably tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. I'm gonna get you. Let's say let's say tomorrow. We'll count on tomorrow. Uh, but I'll talk to you later. Bye bye.